Oh no. Stuck sound effects. They probably tracked me through my internet service provider. I should have used Atlas VPN. You've probably heard of VPNs before. In short, they're a tool that allows you to surf the web as though you're in a different location. By accessing a different server, you're granted a new IP and DNS address. If you don't know what that means, just pretend that using a VPN causes fairies to cast a spell on your computer that makes people think you're somewhere else. If you want to stream a movie or download a game that's unavailable in your area, just use Atlas VPN to pretend that you're in another country and voila. Want to watch Rick and Morty or Cowboy Bebop on Netflix but you live in the US? Just pretend to be Canadian and go nuts. It also works with streaming services like Disney+, Plus, Hulu, Amazon Prime, and HBO. Not just that, it prevents your government or internet service provider from tracking where you go and what you do. Atlas VPN is available on Windows, Android, iOS, and Mac, so no matter what device you use, you can browse the internet safely and anonymously. And it's currently running a deal. Three years of VPN for only $139 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. I'll repeat that for those in the back. Three years of VPN for only $139 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. This deal won't last long, so if you want to get in on the action, click the link in the description below to get started. <sighs> Brothers, sisters, non-binary siblings, I've done it. I have found the worst thing that, that there is. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. For, for, for many years, I have thought and I have said that the Lovely Bones would never be beat. I would never find a worse book or, well, anything really, but mostly I've talked about like, yes, that is worst book ever. I will never find anything worse. And maybe it's on me for tempting fate. You know, I was correct for about nine years, but then along came The Way of the Shadow Wolves by Steven Seagal. And um, normally I have my notes written out. I just, I have them on my laptop this time because like, I there's too much to write by hand. Okay, normally I write by hand because it just, it takes longer, it forces me to think about it more, and it just sticks in my head better. But this, there was just, there was too much. Like, there's probably four or five times more notes in this than I would have otherwise had. And that would just be a giant waste of paper and I just, no, I'm not doing it. And also, like, if you're wondering why I might sound a little different, it's because if you missed my last video, I'm recovering from surgery and the inside of my mouth is just different than it used to be. So I'm still getting used to talking this way, but you know, that's, that, that's neither here nor there. Yes, I, I have way more notes than I ever would have before. Um, although admittedly, a lot of them are like on the background of this book and the author of it, or authors, I should say, because it was actually kind of written by three people. But Steven Seagal is the one whose name is on there because he's the most famous one. I really love reading celebrity books because they're always terrible. And they're always terrible in an entertaining way because they're made by people who just have no idea how the real world works. You know, they're trapped in that bubble of wealth and fame and just they don't know how regular people live a anymore if they ever did. And they ha also just have no writing experience and they have no chance to really get better. And they don't have any proper editors to help clean things up because just by attaching their name to it, they're guaranteed a certain number of sales. So when someone who is that up their own ass writes a book, it makes for some pretty funny results. And obviously this whole series of me uh, doing really long in-depth reviews kind of started with Hilary Duff's Elixir. Now I assumed Steven Seagal's book would be kind of the same as other celebrity books and it sort of is. It's horrible and wrong in so many ways that it's honestly kind of difficult to know where to start because like it, it tries to be an action-packed political thriller but the tone falls somewhere between the room and the naked gun now i used exactly 700 tabs in this book like 
This book is only 220 pages, so that's an average of 3.19 tabs per page. Like, I, I even kept all the uh, sheets, I don't know what these are called, but the containers that all the tabs came in. I get, I get seven of these things. I have gone through entire series without using that many. Th this is kind of insane. There are exactly two pages in this entire book that I did not ha have uh, a tab on. It's page 150 and page 194. The problem is, I don't think either of those counts, because you can see page 150, it's one sentence. Like, okay, congratulations, you didn't fuck up for one sentence. What, what do you want, a medal or something? And page 194 is also only two or three sentences, because it comes at the end of a chapter. So, man, like, sometimes I would get too near the end of a page, and I would think, oh, maybe this one won't be so bad, maybe they won't screw anything up, and then at the last second, something would come in, and I just got, like, ah, crap, I gotta put more on. Like, there, there's so many, it kind of warps how thick the book is. I don't know if it's really showing up on camera, but, like, I can feel it. it is, <sighs> man, the politics that they try to push in this book are really stupid, too. And not, like, I disagree with them. I mean, painfully stupid. Like, you'll see as we go along, but, like, there's a lot of logical fallacies and inconsistencies, and part of that is just because this book is full of plot holes, but... Man, if you thought that True Allegiance was too intellectual, and Trigger Warning was too subtle, and you also yell at cashiers who won't take your expired coupons, then maybe this is for you. But what is this book? Well, its full title is The Way of the Shadow Wolves, The Deep State and the Hijacking of America. It is the tale of John Nantangode, who is a tribal police officer in Arizona, and he uncovers a sinister conspiracy to destroy the United States, and he has to fight back using martial arts as well as his magical Indian spirit powers. I'm gonna say right now this book is pretty racist. Now, on this corner of the internet, the Onision Trilogy is famous because all of the books are just so fascinatingly bad. Like, th the thing about that is that a normal person could not write those. Like, even if they tried on purpose to make something that bad, they just, they just couldn't. You first need to create Onision the Man. And in order to make Onision the Man, you need to have the perfect combo of narcissism, unearned fame, stupidity, sexual hang-ups, unresolved daddy issues, and complete inability to take criticism. That's very rare. But Steven Seagal has all that. <laughs> In a lot of ways, he's kind of the pre-internet Onision, or maybe Onision is the millennial Steven Seagal. It's, it's really not important, but like you learn enough about this guy, and you get a glimpse into his psyche, it starts to make sense how he could make something like this. And th there are a lot of similarities between the two of them, though. Like, in broad strokes, they're both thoroughly unlikable, uncharismatic, untalented people who just stumbled into a large amount of fame and success. And I'll be honest, I'm gonna go a lot into Steven Seagal, and so you have an idea of like what his mindset was when he made this and what the context of this thing is. And if you wanna skip ahead, then go for it. Like it'll just go right to the actual book part, but trust me, having the context, I think will make this a lot better. So I'm willing to bet a lot of you have heard of him in at least vague terms. A lot of you are probably thinking like, oh, okay, yeah, he was some action star from the 80s and 90s who just kind of faded into irrelevance around 20 years ago. And that's, that, that's not wrong. Most of you are pretty young, so you might not have even seen any of his movies and you barely know the name. But like, this man, learning about his life has been a dive into insanity. I know far more about Steven Seagal than any human being ever should. I could honestly make like a two-hour video just about him, but I'm not going to do that. If, uh, if you're curious, part of the research for this video was uh, listening to two episodes of the Behind the Bastards podcast where they did talk about Steven Seagal, and I haven't listened to any other, any other parts of that podcast, so I can't speak for its quality overall, but the ones on Steven Seagal are really good and they are very funny. So Steven Seagal, in addition to, you know, being a movie star, he's he's just a habitual liar, which is very weird. Like, he's claimed a lot of things which are very easy to verify 
are false. Like, he's claimed to be a mafia hitman, a student of Morihei Ueshiba, who was the founder of Aikido, which was definitely not true, because he died when Steven was, like, 15 years old. Uh, he claimed to be a former Navy SEAL, a CIA operative, and he claims that he fought the Yakuza. And the thing is, he'll sometimes make these claims in front of uh, people who he got the stories from. Like, he makes friends with CIA operatives and former Navy SEALs and stuff, and then they'll tell him stories about what they did, and then he'll tell those same stories to other people, and sometimes he'll do it in front of them. It's, it's very weird. He also claims to speak Japanese fluently, which is actually true. Yeah, from, from what I've seen, he actually does speak fluent Japanese, which, uh, honestly, good on him. That's a very difficult language to learn. <laughs> He's also a prolific sexual predator. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that, but he has harassment and assaults on a lot of different women going back to the early 90s. Like, he, he's been in court over this. It's like, the dude is definitely a serial rapist. We're gonna, we're just gonna leave it at that. But he, he is guilty as fuck. And um, he clearly has no idea how humor or jokes work. Uh, based on the, this one time he hosted Saturday Night Live and he tried coming up with a skit in the writer's room and basically the whole joke of the skit was he was saying, all right, I'm going to be a psychologist and I'm talking to a patient and then I'm just going to rape the patient. And like, that was the joke. That was his idea of a joke. Like, th th the more you learn about this, if you're familiar with Onision, you'll know there's a lot of similarities here. Uh, he's abandoned several wives and children. He can't make any relationships work. Uh, in fact, his first wife he married in Japan and he actually stole her savings and uh, left the country without actually divorcing her, and then he married a second woman illegally, and then he tried to marry a third woman while still being illegally married to the first two. And, just like Onision, he's done a lot of different projects over the years, all of which he's bad at. Like, they're, they're both, like, the opposite of Renaissance men. You know, Onision has a musical career, and he's done YouTube comedy, and he tried to run a cult one time, and he tried writing books, and he just sucked at all of them. Like, St Seagal has also done a lot. Uh, the thing about his acting career, which is what he's most famous for, is that every movie he was ever in was terrible. Like, he he's an awful actor, he can't emote, he can't make facial expressions, which would be acceptable if he started off that way and he wanted to learn. Because admittedly, some actors have started off pretty bad and then they've gotten better over time. Like, I think Cara Delevingne has actually gotten a lot better over time, and Channing Tatum as well. Like. When he started off his career, he was terrible, but he's genuinely a really funny actor now, I think. And, but Seagal never had any desire to get better, so he never did. Here's some clips if you're doubting me. You ever notice how clean babies smell like nothing in the world has ever touched them? every motherfucker birthday. All right, bitch, assume the position. You're under arrest. Get up against the wall and give me a hand. Fuck you! Like, every film that he makes just has this ridiculous tough guy persona, which is mixed with his inherent laziness. Like, every fight, he just wins without a sweat. Uh, he foils the bad guy's plans every time without a sweat. He just gets the girl without a sweat. Which, again, if you've read the Onision trilogy, that probably sounds familiar. And his later movies, I'm not making this up. You're gonna think I'm joking, but no, I'm not making this up. He blocks the, his later movies so that he can just sit in a chair 90% of the time. Like, he's gotten progressively fatter in every movie, but he still acts like some big badass. Like, you know, he's almost 70... He's allowed to be fat at that age, there's no shame in it, but you don't get to pretend to still be some big special forces dude that everyone's afraid of. Like, the most dangerous thing about him these days is his blood pressure. The only good movie he ever made was Under Siege. Like, I I'm not even joking. Like, I mean, I mean that unironically. Like, it's a genuinely good movie. Some of his others are fun to watch and laugh at, but Under Siege is just a fun, cheesy action flick. 
Uh, the villains are really over the top. They're a lot of fun. And they kind of contrast with Steven Seagal's corpse-like emotional range, so it, it kind of works. Um, but even beyond that, he's been, you know, a stuntman, and he's actually been known to hit other stuntmen during scenes instead of pretending hit hitting them like you're supposed to do. Uh, he's such a tool, he was banned from hosting Saturday Night Live after that one appearance. One time, he was surrounded by a bunch of other uh, stuntmen and martial artists, and he claimed that he was immune to chokeholds, like you couldn't make him pass out by choking him out. And one of the people who was there was Gene LaBelle, who was a founder, uh, one of the founders of MMA, and he called his bluff and choked him out in front of everybody. Not only did Steven Seagal pass out, he also shit his pants. But as I said, he's done so much more other than movie making. Uh, before acting, he was a semi-accomplished martial artist. I say was because he hasn't done a push-up in 30 years. Uh, in fact, that, that's what he did for a long time, and he only got his first movie role because a talent agent named Michael Ovitz made a bet that he could make the most uncharismatic tool in Los Angeles famous, and he, he just gave him a role in a movie. Or possibly Ovitz was bribed or threatened by the Mafia. It's actually... It's actually kind of unclear. It just... Go with whatever sounds the most fun for for you. Um, but he also had a musical career with two studio albums, and he actually did go around touring. He was in a blues band. The music is terrible, by the way. In fact, a couple years ago, he was supposed to be uh, at a blues festival in Estonia, but he was kicked out because he publicly supported the Russian annexation of Crimea. <laughs> that is that is one hundred percent true. Uh, he was also a sheriff's deputy in Jefferson Parish, Louisiana, even though he was never officially certified as being a cop. Like, he, he never got the proper training or anything. Uh, not, not just that, he wasn't just a volunteer cop, he was in charge of their SWAT training. Like, they had a reality TV show about this and everything, it was, it was nuts. And the thing is, he used to be a deputy because around 10 years ago he got charged with human trafficking, and the charges only got dropped when he paid his accuser half a million dollars. So, you know, feel free to draw your own conclusions from that. At some point, he converted to Tibetan Buddhism, which, like, okay, that's totally fine. I don't have any issues with that. But he officially had himself declared a Lama, which is a holy man that reincarnates by choice. Which means he's, he's one of the highest ranking people in Tibetan Buddhism. He's one step below the Dalai Lama. Specifically, he claims to be the reincarnation of a monk who founded a monastery 400 years ago. And obviously, he's now an author with Way of the Shadow Wolves. Mark my words, one day, someone is going to get an Oscar for playing Steven Seagal in a movie. Like, just, it, it's going to happen, because his life is nuts, and I have not even kind of gone into all the detail that I could have. Now, as I said, politics are really baked into this book. Like, it, it's impossible to avoid it entirely, but I will avoid it whenever possible. Now, the thing is, I, I'm only gonna like, talk about it when it's particularly egregious, like when there's really obvious logical flaws in there, or when it's just a really big part of the story that I have to bring up, or something like that. But I'm still going to be leaving the majority of the claims in here out. So I, if you're watching this later and you're thinking, James, you said you were gonna leave out most of the politics, but you're still talking a lot about it, I know. Like, there's still a lot, and I left most of it out. Now, as I said, there were three authors that worked on this, kinda, and all three of them are deeply involved with right-wing political movements. Like, first up is former Sheriff Joe Arpaio, who used to be the sheriff of Maricopa County, which is where the city of Phoenix is located, and he's also an unsuccessful congressional candidate. Like, he, he writes a really brief foreword to this book, where he claims to be the regional director of the DEA office in Mexico and Latin America, which is untrue, or he claims that he used to be that. It's still untrue. Uh, then he goes on about how drugs were coming across the border until President Trump scared them off with his mighty schlong. The whole world is out to get him specifically. The deep state is destroying America, even though they actually already control America. Like, why would they want to destroy it? It's not very interesting, and it doesn't make much sense. Um, Arpaio is kind of unimportant, so I'm not going to point out how, as sheriff, he forced inmates to live in a place that he himself described as a concentration camp. Uh, it would also be rude of me to point out how he stole over $100 million of taxpayer money. And who could forget 
how the U.S. Department of Justice determined that his department was guilty of some of the worst profiling in American history. It would be really rude of me to point all that out, so I'm not going to do so. But despite all of this hardship, he still continued to ignore court orders which got him charged with contempt of court for which he was pardoned by the former president. Really, the deep state has been out to get him for so long that he's been able to do whatever he wants for years with impunity. Like, his, his life must be so hard. Hello guys, uh, Editor James here. I was just doing some last minute research for this video, and it turns out that Joe Arpaio, despite writing the foreword for this book, and despite writing in the foreword how realistic this book is, and how it's just like his life and career, and yada yada, at some point, it, he admitted that he's never read it. Like, wh why would you do that? Like, whether you're promoting this book out of ideological agreement with it, or just because you're being paid, why why would you ever do that? All that does is make your endorsement completely worthless. I I, I, I don't know, that, that just kind of caught me off guard, and I figured you should all know about it too. The other author is Tom Morrissey, and I don't know if there's much to say about him. Like, he was the former head of the Arizona Republican Party, and he is currently the mayor of the town of Payson, Arizona. Uh, he's been a politician and a law enforcement officer for several decades, though, so you know he's a real political outsider, which makes him the perfect person to talk about how all politicians and cops are in on this nefarious conspiracy. And then there's Steven Seagal, who has a history of political activism, too. He's personal friends with Vladimir Putin, as well as a couple of other dictators and dictator light type dudes. Um, and he spends a lot of time talking about how awesome he is and how awesome other authoritarian leaders are. Uh, here's him giving a sword to the president of Venezuela. Now, to be fair, I don't disagree with Steven Seagal on everything. Like, he's actually spent a lot of time advocating for environmental protections and animal rights, with which I agree with, so good on him for that. I just wish he took animal rights more seriously when he drove a tank into someone's house and killed his dog. Yes, he really did that. I'm gonna take you to the bank, Senator Trent. To the blood bank. But, finally, after all that, let's get to talking about the actual book. It, it took a lot longer than I wanted it to, but you know, here we are. And the best place to start is with the beginning. And by the beginning, I mean the cover. So, the cover of this book is just a picture of a man with a wolf's face in the background. Kind of cheesy, but honestly, on the surface, it could be a lot worse than that. Once you dig below the surface, though, there's a lot of problems. Like, problem one, there are these weird black lines over the wolf's face. Like, I don't even know if they really pick up on camera, but, like, at first I saw them and I thought they were, like, eyelashes or hairs that fell from my head and were on there, but I tried wiping it off and, like, no, that's part of the book. And th this is a new copy, by the way. It's not like this was used and the previous owner was drawn on it. Like, that's just, that's just something they screwed up on. And then the cover model is just Steven Seagal. Which, yeah, just, jeez, man. It, it kind of looks like they photoshopped his face onto a slimmer, younger body. Except that his face is really low resolution. It's like 360p. It's very weird. And then on, the thing is, on the back, we have another photo of Steven Seagal for the author photo. Which, you know, makes sense. And the thing is, that author photo is about 30 years old. Now, you obviously want to choose a good photo of yourself for that, so choosing an older one is understandable, if a tad vain, but then on the front we have current Steven Seagal. Like, that, that defeats the purpose. And then Tom Morrissey's photo makes it look like he's gonna call me smooth skin and ask if I have any spare caps. And problem number three, this makes it very clear that John, the main character of the book, is just a self-insert protagonist. Like, uh, when Hilary Duff was the cover model for Elixir, like, it's really obvious there that she just wanted to insert herself into the story, and it's very, very cringy. But it's even worse here, because John is an American Indian, and Steven Seagal is not, no matter how much buckskin he wears. Now, Steven Seagal is one-quarter Cherokee, in that he weighs one-fourth as much as a Jeep Grand Cherokee, uh, but he, he's, he's not Native American. He's not an American Indian. Uh, even though on the back he claims to be Cherokee, because every white person who claims to have in American Indian ancestry claims to be Cherokee for some reason. It, 
it's generally frowned upon to pretend that, to be a race that you're not, Stephen. I hope you are aware of that. I mean, Taylor Lautner isn't an Indian either, but he played one for five movies. Uh, for what it's worth, Steven Seagal's family, uh, his mother's family were German, English, and Dutch, and his father's family were Russian Jews. The thing is, he has a very long history of pretending to be other races. Like, during his Reddit AMA, which you should read because it's hysterical, he claimed that he was once in an all-black band, which is impossible, because if he was in the band, then it wasn't all black. Uh, he claimed to be Italian one time. He, he's claimed to be Asian in a movie review one time. Is is weird. Now he's pretending to be an American Indian, which he's just whatever is most convenient to him at the time, I suppose. I uh, am a little bit Asian, and I'm a Russian Mongol, and I'm Russian. My father was a Russian Mongol, so these people are Russian Mongols. Of Italian descent? Yeah, I have some Italian on my mother's side. and I I'm Russian. My family are from Vladivostok and Belarus and, you know. Okay, Editor James back here with uh, one more thing I have to add. Uh, apparently, Seagal has also claimed at some point to be either Kalmyk or Buryat. I, I hope I'm pronouncing both those right. And if you've never heard of those, they're both pretty small ethnic groups that are native to Russia, and I I feel like it goes without saying that no, it's he's not either of those, it's not true. He claims that his grandfather was one of those, but he's not sure which, but the thing is, they live on opposite ends of Russia. They're, they're very far apart. Like, they're, they're related ethnic groups, but that, that's kind of like saying that your grandfather is either Romanian or Portuguese, but you're not sure which. It's it's just so odd that he would lie about things that are so easily verified. You actually open it up and look at the contents. There is the standard, oh, this book is a work of fiction, yada yada message. It, but then it's followed by, but remember, truth comes in many forms. So is this a realistic depiction of exactly what the real world is like, or is it a work of fiction? Make up your mind, guys. As I said, there's a short foreword written by Arpaio. It has factual inaccuracies. It's just an old man complaining that the government is out to get him despite being part of the government. It's not that interesting. Then you have a preface coming after that, which is also not that interesting. It's full of leading questions to try and make you believe what they're saying, which you can do with pretty much anything. It's like if I started asking people, is it possible that Steven Seagal is a pedophile? Like, that, that's a leading question. So then, we go to chapter one, Ch Tribal Police, America's Frontline in the Desert. Is this where the actual story starts? No, of course not. Why the fuck would you think that? The first chapter is the main character, John, in a movie theater, watching a documentary about shadow wolves. Now, shadow wolves are a group of legendary Indian warriors with magical powers. How these powers work and how the Shadow Wolves work, and why they weren't used to fight the Americans and other colonizers who came in back in the day, is never explained or brought up. So there's also a couple of paragraphs about how the U.S. about how badly the U.S. government treated Indians over the years, which is not wrong, but you should really keep that in mind as the book goes on. It also tends to leave how regular citizens treated them out of it. Native Americans have an innate and powerful spiritual connection with the Earth and its creatures an understanding of the true nature of all that is on this planet and how it works in the perfect balance of cause and effect. An elite group within the Native American communities, known as Shadow Wolves, are part of this perfect balance and are the best of the best, with the ability to see what can't be seen with the eyes. They know without having to be taught. They blend easily with the night. True right from wrong is ingrained in their souls, which makes them able to stand against evil, no matter the cost, to see footprints on rocks. Okay, so we're two pages in and we're already knee-deep in shit. Um, for starters, the worst way you can start a story is with exposition. Even if it's good exposition, that's just the worst way to, to start because it feels almost like you're doing homework at that point. You're just like, whoa, this, this is a lot here. I, please slow down. Um, but this is not good exposition because John already knows about Shadow Wolves. And John is a Shadow Wolf. Why is he watching a movie about them? Don't know, but here we are. And obviously, all those statements were super vague, like about they know without having to be taught, they can see footprints on rocks, they know true right from wrong. Like, is this all meant to be metaphorical or literal? Like, by the end of the book, I'm still unsure. 
This is what's known as telling, not showing. But then you're also still not giving much information, and then you continue telling over and over throughout the whole book. It's also kind of racist. Like, you know, this description of Native Americans kind of falls into that exotic, mystic, noble, savage stereotype, which I suppose it's a positive stereotype, if anything, which is really... that's still not good. Uh, and he also refers to them as Native Americans. Now, you might notice that throughout most of this I've been calling them American Indians or Indians, because that's what most of them prefer to be called. And the fact that this book goes with a different name is kind of an indicator of how little knowledge the three white dudes who wrote this thing have of the subject matter and how they didn't bother researching at all. You're gonna see that come up a lot. Chapter 2, Deep State Sign in the Desert. The clouds, a brilliant orange, were hanging on the horizon, with sun rays lighting them from bottom up as the daylight crept behind the mountains, off in the distance but not too far from where a man named John Goad was standing. A dust devil was dancing across a place between him and the setting sun. This tall, lean man, who in the approaching darkness could have easily been confused with a Seguro cactus, was breathing in the beautiful scene before him. Alright, first, that's a lot of obnoxious run-on sentences. You should really learn to chill out with those because it's difficult to read, especially when you're reading out loud. Uh, second, we have yet another in the long line of right-wing thrillers with a big protagonist that the author projects onto. Uh, the main difference is that Steven Seagal actually is pretty tall, so they had to make sure that we know that John is lean because Seagal is fucking fat. I'm gonna keep bringing that up because you, uh, you don't get to act like some big badass when that's the case. Uh, and it is mentioned that he's tall or big 48 times in this book. I counted 48 times. Like, Jesus, dude, just wear all your insecurities on your sleeve, why don't you? So we get, like, a classic backstory about John's life, which is, you know, more exposition. That's... <laughs> slow down. I don't want to enjoy myself too much, but... Yeah, it's a pretty basic... You know, he was an Indian who grew up on reservation... He joined the Marines, and then after he left the Marines, he became a tribal police officer. And then while he was a kid, his grandfather taught him the old ways. Now, every time old ways comes up in this book, it's in quotes. I, I don't know why. Uh, I also don't know what the old ways are. Like, I, I, I think it's the techniques of the Shadow Wolves and how those work, but not much is ever explained, and there's not much info given, and that would be fine if there, if we had the opportunity to figure things out on our own, but we didn't get that either. So, this is basically all we learn about John as a person throughout the whole book. Like, he's a good fighter, and that's his backstory. Uh, beyond that, I suppose he's like an ultra-nationalist, sorry, patriot, but beyond that, there's, there's really nothing there. We don't learn much about his relationships, his goals in life, his reasons for joining the Marines, or his reasons for becoming a cop. Like, I want to criticize this, but there's honestly nothing there to criticize. He's just an empty shell that the authors are projecting onto. And there's not even much to critique about his beliefs, because he's just repeating the author's beliefs. So going through this, he mentions how the Indians were led down a path of total dependence by the government. That's not how that works. They, they underwent a genocide, and then the government felt kind of guilty about it, so it decided to provide for them. But they didn't feel that guilty, because they don't do a very good job of it. So then, when things actually start happening, basically, he's way out in the desert by himself. A couple of men surround John while he's doing some sort of dance, and he's, like, bidding the sun good night, which I... What? Like, this book throws out so many undefined terms and phrases, which make no sense. Uh, and he pretends not to notice the men surrounding him, and then a wolf appears, and it kisses John on the forehead, and then John hides somehow in the desert with nothing, nowhere to hide. He somehow does that with no effort, and then the men look for him, can't find him, and then they just disappear. And then it just cuts to a flashback, and it explains a lot of information all at once with no passion. So basically... John met a kid named Sweet Tooth, or Sweet Tooth is obviously a nickname, his real name is Henry, 
but the book uses both those names interchangeably, which makes it kind of confusing to read about sometimes. Great, uh, but I'll, I'll just be referring to him as uh, Sweet Tooth throughout all this. And basically, Sweet Tooth was just out camping in the middle of the desert uh, at a couple of points, actually, and he keeps seeing these black SUVs driving throughout the desert at nighttime, and he thinks it's suspicious, so he came and told the police. Which, that actually makes sense. You know, they're right along the border with Mexico. It could be cartel activity or smuggling or something. Like, it, you know, it's, it's worth looking into, at least. And so Sweet Tooth takes him out to a campsite where he was. This was a remote area, loaded with snakes and scorpions, and despite Sweet Tooth's claim of wanting to be alone, it made no sense for him to be out there in the middle of the night, alone. Okay, if I read every bad line in here, it, I would just be reading you the whole book, so I'm really only giving you the worst, but that should give you an idea. Like, I want to be alone, but it doesn't make sense for you to be alone. Okay, whatever. So, John claims in his narration that the deep state and the media are working with drug lords to bring in illegal immigrants and drugs. No proof of this is ever given, by the way. Like, he, he just says that, but, like, he never finds any evidence of it or presents any evidence of it. The thing is, this is fiction. They, you could easily make something up to support your views, but the, the authors of this can't even do that. They're just saying, huh, my beliefs are so obvious I won't even bother explaining myself. Like, that, that's the attitude they have with this. Which is kind of an indictment of how little they think about their beliefs. Plus, it's just boring for the protagonist to already have knowledge about everything that comes up in the book. Like, th he doesn't have to work for any knowledge of the consp conspiracy or anything like that. Like, he just already knows it, so... We don't get to watch him find anything out or anything like that. It's stupid. What troubled John even more was that the country was asleep when it came to the OTMs, or other than Mexicans, coming across a virtually open southern border into the country and possibly assembling for what America had never known before, a jihadi caliphate. Do you know what either of those words means? A, a jihadi is a person. It's a noun. It's not an adjective. You don't use jihadi to describe something. Like, that would be like calling something a soldier country. Like, it just doesn't make sense grammatically. You're just throwing scary words out there without understanding what they mean. Like, there's no research in any of this. It would have taken you 30 seconds to learn all that. Uh, but, you know, back to John and company. Uh, he follows some footprints, and he somehow knows that they aren't sweet tooths without checking. Like, he sees them, and he doesn't go, Hey, sweet tooth, let me look at your footprints or something so that he can check, like he just already knows. Uh, and he keeps going on random tangents too, like it, it's a little hard to keep this on track because of that, but there's one tangent about how John has the spirit of the snake in his bloodline, giving him power over some people and many snakes. I don't know what that means either. Um, anyway, some coyotes arrive, John scares them off by talking in some other language, which is weird because I thought he had power over snakes and not coyotes, but uh, all right, you're you're the author here. I I won't uh, I won't get in your way. He sat absolutely still, watching closely as the big man holstered his weapon and knelt down, picking up something small. He examined it slowly. The young Native American didn't know it, but John had discovered a tooth lying on a flat rock. There was a slight blood trail leading away from where he found it. A strange energy came over John as he folded it into a page he tore from a small notebook he kept in his pocket. Okay, so that was just not as bad as a lot of other lines, but it's clumsy, is the thing. Because it, I think it's trying to do omniscient narrator, where you al always know what everyone is thinking all the time. But it's just kind of switching back and forth way too quick. So it's just going, this person knows this, this per other person knows that. And it gets a little confusing, and it also gives up any chance for mystery or tension. So, anyways, though... Um, they find a mutilated dead woman buried, uh, <clears throat> or buried very shallowly in the desert, and Sweet Tooth mentions that he thinks the Mexican military are doing maneuvers in Arizona. That's stupid because maneuvers are big and you can't keep that under wraps, and it's also stupid because it never comes back up. Like, they just mentioned it this one time and never again. Uh, and finally, Sweet Tooth, like, gives his whole story. He basically says that his brother started making money somehow and bringing it home. 
and then he went missing, and Sweet Tooth thinks that his brother is somehow involved in cartel business. And he also mentions that Arabs were with the cartels as they were working. Mexicans. No Americans? Just Mexicans? John pushed him, trying to get a fix on whether or not they might be deep state operatives. No, they weren't American, but he said that there were these heavy breathing Arab guys coming out with them. Heavy breathing? What was making them breathe heavy? No, it doesn't have nothing to do with breathing. It's like the way they talk, man. He said they sound like they're gargling when they speak. They got some bad accents. Okay, the thing is, if they're trying to sneak into the country, there's easier ways to do that because than just pretending to be Mexican. Because just because you can't tell the difference doesn't mean that the Mexicans can't tell the difference. But anyways, uh, John calls up uh, other police and the CSI shows up and John leaves, but he keeps the tooth that he hid earlier. And then he goes back to Shadow Wolf headquarters, and that's, that's chapter three. Where you been, Moose? Bellamy, one of the task force members, asked when John walked through the door into the squad room. John didn't respond because his attention was taken by what was lying on his desk. It was a picture of a beautiful young woman posing in a seductive red dress. Her hair was copper, flaring around her tan face. Her eyes captivated him immediately. Who's this? He nodded at the photo. Some gal who says she needs to talk with you, and right away. What's with the picture? John asked curiously. I guess it's a motivator to get you in touch right away. That would work for me. Bellamy had a smile on his face. She say what this was about? John took off his black jacket, which had a patch on the left sleeve with, it, with an insignia of a wolf encapsulated in an arrowhead, and draped it across the back of his chair. She said it was about something you might be interested in knowing. Claims she's an investigative reporter, following a story you might want to hear. So, Steven Seagal thinks that women reporters get in touch with their inside sources by physically mailing pinups of themselves? He, he thinks that that's how women get access to things? I mean, that's sexist, but okay. It would have been so easy to look up how investigative reporters get in touch with Whatever. Whatever, man. So, anyways, Bellamy, the other Shadow Wolf, we get a bit of information about him. Apparently, he can win any fight by believing that he can. By that logic, I could beat Conor McGregor by just believing in myself really hard. Or by standing still and waiting for him to turn his body slightly. I guess that could work too. So then John spends several pages relaying what just happened to Bellamy. And this sort of thing happens throughout the book, by the way. Like, it's a miserable fraction of the word count. Like, things will happen, and then John will go to other characters and relay everything that happened to those other characters. It, it just happens over and over again. Like, it could just be a sentence or two. Like, it, they could just say, Oh, John relayed what had happened with Sweet Tooth to Bellamy. Bellamy looked concerned. Like, there, just a sentence or two. It's that easy. John also thinks that the dead woman was there to send a message. How? How is that sending a message? Her body was hidden. Do you think that when you send a message, you put it somewhere where no one will see it? That's that's not what a message is, Stephen. How do you how do you think this works? Okay, and then John goes to talk to his boss, whose name is Armando, and tells him that they should investigate Sweet Tooth's campsite. Why does he think this? Well, because his gut told him to. Okay, the thing is, throughout this entire book, basically. Everything that John does is just because his gut told him to. Like, it's a stupid excuse that they go back to over and over and over again. Because they can't think of any real reasons why a real detective would look into this. But the thing is, th this makes sense. Like, it makes sense why you would go look at Sweet Tooth's campsite. That's what an actual investigator would do. So it's like the one time in the book that he's following the evidence and they still use the gut excuse. Which is so weird to me, because... Seagal, Morrissey, they, they both worked in law enforcement. They should know how criminal investigations work, but apparently they don't. So they go there, they investigate a little bit, and they discover, like, yeah, apparently Mexican military or people dressed like the Mexican military have not only been making incursions into the U.S. for months, but they've been killing people for six months, and, like, they've been beheading them and leaving their bodies out there. That wouldn't be a secret, Steven. You can't keep that under wraps. Oh my god. Just 
Oh my god, no. No, 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 no. So Armando decides to put John in charge of the task force for the time being. I'm putting John here in charge. The 5 foot 8 inch fire plug of a man nodded toward the big man. Okay, first of all, you should never use exact height and weights when you're describing characters, because it's just too specific and it allows for a lot less imagination for the readers. Like, and it bogs down the prose. Like, you should just say things like, tall as a tree, or skinny as a twig. Like, those work a lot better. And, quite frankly, the height is like the only description we get of most of the characters, if that. Like, pretty much every time it introduces someone, it's like, a man named Dave came up. And like, well, what does Dave look like? I don't know. And yeah, you should also avoid using the same word twice in a sentence. Like he goes, man, and then man again. Like it, it gets weird. So then uh, someone mentions that John doesn't usually rush into things, which is really weird because John spends this entire book rushing into things over and over again. Look, you should show and not tell. But if you're going to tell, you need to have it match up with what you show. And then they introduce a bunch of other Shadow Wolves, including Deanne Higgins, who is a DEA agent who can hold her own, but she never does anything in the book. And then another agent named Bonnie Sims, who also never does anything in the book. And then they all just head off into the desert, and some interesting things go on. A pack of four-legged coyotes ran past John's vehicle without stopping to investigate as opposed to six-legged coyotes? So, while they're just out wandering the desert, they see a Border Patrol vehicle driving around. And rather than just see, thinking, oh, we're near the border, there's a Border Patrol vehicle, nothing weird going on here, John has a tail put on it because his gut tells him to. And then he also guesses where it's going. Like, they're out in the middle of the desert, there's no roads or anything nearby. And he's like, hey, we need to put a tail on them. Like, well, we don't know where they're going. And he just he just guesses where they're going. And he he happens to be 100% correct in that. So he manages to put a tail on them without any issue. And the thing is, if that just happened once or twice, that's fine. Like, you're allowed to have characters guess at things and get it right or have a coincidence to get them out of trouble once or twice. But it happens constantly. It's just reality shifting around protagonist Kuhn to make his life easier. And then, off screen, by the way, uh, other police pursue the Border Patrol vehicle because it turns out, oh, it's a fake Border Patrol vehicle. Like, there's some someone else in there who shouldn't be in there. And then they shoot at the ve vehicle, and then the other people shoot back, and then they bail out and they run off on foot. And again, this is all off screen. It's all described in two paragraphs. Don't give me too much excitement, Steven. It might raise my heart rate. So then John arrives at the scene, and he tells the others what's going on. He's like, oh, there's a fake Border Patrol vehicle, and we don't know what they're up to, but we know it's not good. And we also learn that the Shadow Wolves share a knowing from their spiritual connection. Like, does that mean they have a hive mind? If they have a hive mind, why do they talk to each other at all? Because they should already know everything? This is the problem with not explaining characters' powers. Okay, you just leave the audience confused. Like, they're going to be thinking, oh, why don't they just do this? Or can't they do that? And at other times, they, we just learn out of nowhere, like, oh, they can do this. And it turns out to be a massive deus ex machina. And that happens a lot in this book. Like, every time uh, they're in trouble, they just reveal a new Shadow Wolf power. And none of them are very impressive. You'd think with so many, at least one of them would be kind of neat. But no, he can just, he just has power over some people and many snakes. Uh, so all excitement and interest is just gone. So the fake Border Patrol are holding people hostage in a house off the road. A loud, wailing woman's scream came from the house. They knew something bad was happening, or about to happen, because of the nervous intruders who might hurt the couple. Okay, we, you literally just needed to say the woman was screaming, and we, we get the picture. Like, you don't need to keep going after that. Like, it just bogs everything down. Especially with action, like, you want everything to be, you know, quick, 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 because that's what this scene is supposed to be. It's supposed to be exciting. And, uh, anyways, John decides to go in before the SWAT team arrives, because there's no time to wait for the SWAT team. Which is exactly the wrong thing to do. Like, you're, if you go in guns blazing, you're gonna get hostages killed in the crossfire. Like, what you're supposed to do in this situation is set up a perimeter, get a hostage negoci negotiator. Like, you don't go in shooting unless the 
hostage or hostage taker starts killing people. Like John and company are so obsessed with being badasses that they just throw away common sense and all their training. I'm sure that says nothing about the authors who all worked in law enforcement. So they go in, they save one of the hostages. The gunmen retreat to another room with the other hostage, and then they say, come out assholes, and then the bad guys surrender. Like it was, it was just, it was that easy. It's impossible to get engaged when it's that easy. Like the, the point of action scenes is for the characters to struggle in reaching a goal and for that struggle to be shown in an exciting way. Without that, it's just noise. Like sometimes you can get away with having an action scene with no point or that's too easy in visual form, like in a movie or something, but you really can't do that in books. They had functioned like a well-oiled machine that had just saved two innocent lives. All lives matter, do they not? I feel like I should criticize that, but I'm also not sure what point he's making. Um, so we're just going to move on. Chapter 4, Inside the Federal Building. Oh yeah, I should point out, we're only 29 pages in. So this new chapter follows a new character, a special agent whose nickname is Mo. Why the fuck are you letting our cartel jihadist allies get captured by the locals? You are supposed to know where every local LEA is all of the time and give those people clear passage. This is a presidential priority. One more screw up and you're headed for Alaska. Dogface looked around the table. Every person in the room was a 34th degree bubba with a lifetime of service to the cause. And each was in one of the top three positions of their respective agency for the Southwestern FEMA District 6 territory. Okay, there's several things wrong here. One, cartel jihadists makes no goddamn sense. Uh, in addition to just tons of ideological differences, jihadis, like, in the world that this book is trying to create, jihadis want to destroy America. Like, in reality, it's a little wider than that. Like, I'm not gonna defend jihadis, but, like, it's not every one of them just going, yeah, let's destroy America, that's our whole reason for being. Like, it, but in this book, that's it. But, like, the America is full of the cartel's customers, and the cartels know this. They would never help destroy their own source of income. Plus, if they were helping terrorists, then the entire might of the US military would come down on them. Like, they, they don't tolerate that shit. And even if the US military didn't, like, ordinary citizens would at some point. Second, what the hell is a 34th degree Bubba? Like, it's not explained here, it's not explained elsewhere. Uh, there's even a glossary at the back, which is like the most unhelpful glossary ever, which does not explain what a 34th degree Bubba is. It just says, yeah, it's a Bubba of the 34th degree. Like, wow, thanks for the help, asshole. Um, it's just someone who's important in this massive conspiracy. Like, I did a little bit of outsert side research. I think that's a, an Illuminati thing, but I, I'm not totally sure. And also they don't really mention the Illuminati at any other point in this book. Look, I shouldn't have to do outside research to understand the setting. All right, if this is supposed to be a warning to people in the real world, because this is this is real life, real life events, it's fiction inspired by the real world. If that's what it's supposed to be, then warn us. Otherwise, this is just a masturbatory fantasy. So anyways, Mo goes on to explain the evil plan to his henchmen and to the audience as well, by proxy. Uh, basically, they're going to use the National Guard to bring in 500 jihadis in a night and then spread them around the country. Okay, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but there, there are much easier ways to bring in terrorists than to bring in a whole bunch of other people in a massive conspiracy which has hundreds or thousands of co-conspirators and then leave tons of evidence behind. Like, there's easier ways to do it. They could just have fake passports, or they could use Americans who are already radicalized for one reason or another. They could smuggle them in in shipping containers. Like, these things are so much easier, and if this was a real thing, then that's what they would be doing. And plus, it's later revealed that they bring in over a thousand jihadis a month, and they've been doing this for a while. So, why do you need a new plan to bring in 500 in a night? And if it's not a new plan, why are you explaining it to all your henchmen? They should already know this. It's also revealed that both the American and Mexican police are aware that there's something going on, and that they're moving to investigate or to stop it, and the bad guys to distract from this and prevent them from doing that are going to declare the Yucatan independent. Man, you can't convince us that this huge deep state conspiracy is so dangerous when you're also making them so 
obvious and incompetent. Like, they don't work very well as villains in this case either. Like, it's just... It, it's no good from a story perspective or from trying to convince people of your ideals perspective. And the best part of that whole chapter is that Agent Mo never comes back. He's never mentioned again. Nor is the whole Yucatan crisis that they were going to cause ever mentioned again. Like, it just... It, it's gone. It's gone now. That that whole bit was just there to give the audience some exposition. So then we go back to John, who is interrogating the three prisoners that they took after the hostage situation. And I'm gonna tell you right now, this takes up a huge chunk of the rest of the book. Like, we're, we're barely getting started, and there's just a huge chunk of the rest is taken up by just them interrogating these three guys. And it's a little... it's really annoying to read about because none of them get names at first, so they just refer to them as the first man, or the young man, and their names kind of switch around too, so I still am not sure which is which. Like, it would be so easy to just say, my name's Rodrigo, or something like that. Like, whatever. Come on, asshole. You got something to say. Say it. He was pushing hard, but getting nowhere with Bellamy. The lawman got up slowly from his chair and backed out of the room, never changing the expression on his face, or breaking eye contact with the manacled man glaring at him. I... I suppose that's one way to start an interrogation. So they try talking to one of them with the your friends are ready to cut a deal trick, and it's like, oh, you, they're gonna leave you high and dry, you better tell us something or you're, you're screwed. And then it, it doesn't work very well. And then one of the Shadow Wolves, a guy named Noach, I believe, uh, he managed to get one prisoner to like him, actually. It happens completely off screen, because why would we want to see the interesting part? But, you know, he, he gets one of them to like him. And the prisoner's talking a little bit, and he says, They're working with Pakistanis who are pretending to be Mexican by speaking Spanish. Okay, I know I already said this, but like, just because you can't tell the difference doesn't mean that they can't. And later they mention, and even before this, they mention all the bad guys are speaking Arabic. They do not speak Arabic in Pakistan. The people there are not Arab. Like, they... They are a couple of different ethnic groups, and they speak a bunch of different languages. Arabic is not one of them. Like, Jesus Christ. Dude, it's not that hard to learn things. So then, while they're trying to get them to talk, some federal agents arrive and say, hey, we're gonna take the prisoners into custody. Like hell you will, was John's instant response. These three belong to us until we say that they don't. Not anymore. We got warrants. Federal warrants. He waved some papers at John, indicating that he was holding the warrants in his hand. Am I in hell? Is this punishment for my sins? So John tries to act all tough and he refuses to hand him over? Like, it, you don't have a choice in this case, man. Federal law enforcement is the highest. They can override tribal police. And the agent, by, by the name, his... The agent's name is Wilson. And... John apparently gives him a look which where he like gives no expression on his face and it's like an ancient Chinese technique or something. Here I thought Steven Seagal never moving his facial muscles was because he was a terrible actor. Nope, turns out it was an ancient Chinese technique that he learned when he was in Japan. In an instant, John Goad was gone, and Wilson knew he was not going to prevail over this shadowy man who passed through him like a heavy wind passes through a forest. Yeah, you know, the best way to make your villains intimidating is to constantly remind the audience how scared they are of the heroes and how amazing the heroes are. That's how you make us scared. Jesus Christ. Th this, this fails on every level. I, I really, really want to hammer that home. How this book fails on every conceivable level. So they get one prisoner to talk by scaring him with a snake because remember, the Shadow Wolves have power over some people and many snakes. And... He mentions that the Arab guys like to party out in the desert. Again, Pakistanis aren't Arabs. In fact, other than that one reference, the book never says anything about Pakistan or Pakistani people. That's what happens when you are, one, a dumbass, and two, you don't go back and edit your book. Like, I, I can tell you almost for certain that they did not do any proper editing for this. Like, they, they did spell check, and that's it. So John thinks back, and he remembers that Sweet Tooth's brother was apparently in charge of lining up hashish and prostitutes for parties for all the terrorists, and 
he deduces like, oh yes, all the terrorists, they, they're the only people that love hashish and prostitutes. Now, I've never bought hashish. I don't think it would be that hard for a criminal organization to get a hold of it, but I also don't think they would have some newbie do it. You know, if they, if they just have the new guy do it, he might do something dumb, like blab to his brother, and then his brother goes off and tells the cops. You really believe this is that deep, John? Sleeper cells of Muslim terrorists? The big lawman was almost thinking out loud. Why would high rollers come through this godforsaken part of the state? Why wouldn't they do this in Mexico, where they wouldn't have the risk of being caught, especially if there are Mexicano importantes protecting them? Doesn't add up. Yeah, it doesn't. You're pointing out your own plot holes. Why are you doing that? So they go back to one prisoner, and that one prisoner says he'd never betray his friends. And then we go to the next chapter, which is a flashback. So the prisoner, uh, his name is Hoban, by the way, it's back when he was a kid, and he was orphaned by cartel violence along with some of his friends, and then a hitman sees them one day, and he has them kill a guy for him, and after that he just kind of takes them under his wing and sort of raises them. I guess it's implied that he's meant to be like a father figure towards them, but it, it never really comes back. But it this bit really annoys me especially because he gives one of the kids a gun and says, all right, kill that dude. And the kid goes, oh, they use that cliche where he's like, I don't know how to use a gun. And he's like, oh, it's easy. Just point and shoot. No, it's not that easy, guys. It, it's more complicated than that, okay? Steven Seagal is a marksman trainer for the police. Like, he should know this. It kind of makes me think that the, those cops can't aim for shit now. But, like, I, I've just seen that in so many movies and stuff. And it, it really irks me because, no, guns are not that easy to fire. Like, all, literally all they could do is just go like, okay, this is the safety here, you want to line up the sights there, and then you just slowly squeeze the trigger, don't jerk it. And like, just that little bit of instruction would not turn you into an expert marksman, but it would be enough to get you started at least. But more important than all of that is that this flashback, this, this chapter did not need to be here. In fact, it, the flashback would have been a little bit more effective if it was just a couple of sentences of vague memories like it would let us fill in the blanks and like i said most of this doesn't come back you know it's not important uh who, who is uh the guy the hitman was uh, hard to talk it wasn't important who the hitman was or how exactly he joined the cartel like just have some vague memories of like oh he was a kid and he shot somebody and lets us fill in the blanks ourselves and we can start to kind of feel sorry for this dude and also understand like why he wound up in this position so then the next chapter, in the modern day, John manages to convince Agent Wilson not to take the prisoners back because he says he's on the cusp of getting them to give up information. And Wilson agrees to this. Why the fuck does Wilson agree to this? So, for starters, I don't think a regular federal agent would, would do this. Like, I don't think he would have the authority to do this. Like, he's either doing what his boss told him or he's following protocol. Like, he can't just unilaterally decide, okay, I, I won't take them back from you. And it, we find out pretty quickly that Wilson is in on the conspiracy. Like, he's here, to, he's here to take the prisoners so that they don't give up any sensitive information to people and because that, that would interfere with their plans. So why would you allow others access to this information? And you're probably thinking that the information that John takes from the prisoners is what he uses to save the day, and yeah, that's exactly what happens, sort of. We'll, we'll get there when we get there, but... Just, the whole plot revolves around the villains being dumbasses. This is not goodbye, my friend. Think of it more as, see you soon, because you will. See me soon. Trust me, warned the head agent. Armando thought, this guy takes himself way too seriously. The sign of a true narcissistic prick. Oh my god, this is, this is so close to self-awareness. Oh my god, this is so close. So close to self-awareness. Not... Not just for John and most of the other good guys in this book, but for Seagal himself. Like, just... You're right there. You're right there, man. You just need that little push. So off-screen, again, because why would we want to see the interesting bits, uh, Noach got more information out of the prisoner. He relays this information to John, and he, it seems like the prisoner is not on board with everything his bosses are doing. And John says, okay, we should follow up on this because his gut is telling him something big is going on and that it leads all the way back to Washington, D.C. Again, this is based on no evidence or anything. It's just his gut tells him that, and his gut is never wrong throughout this entire book. I was not born on a fucking turnip truck, man. And then we go to the next chapter. 
This next chapter follows a Mexican intelligent agent named Jose. Jose Maria Gutierrez de Porras, the top counterintelligence officer in Mexico who reported directly to the president of Mexico, was pissed. Seriously pissed. People, I need some ideas. The deep state to the north is on the move. We are seeing 1,000 jihadists a month going north, and they seem to have almost miraculous powers both here in Mexico and across the border, as if they were on diplomatic passports, all expenses paid. Okay, so in addition to the plot hole about the number of jihadis that I already mentioned, this is a really clumsy way to introduce a character. Like, if the last name isn't needed, then just don't put the last name in there. Like, you could have just said Jose, the top counterintelligence officer, and then officer, and then kept going for that. And you should also not use the same word twice in a sentence. Like I said, he uses the word Mexican twice in a sentence, and it just feels awkward. And this is another chapter of a character, j just like Agent Mo before. This is another chapter of a character who shows up and is never brought back or mentioned again and is just here for exposition. And the thing is, if you're going to have more chapters like that, just reuse the same person for all of them. Like, just reuse Agent Mo for all of them. So we could actually start to get, maybe not attached to him, but we could at least learn a little bit about him and see him as, like, the face of the villains or something. And, all right, anyways, Jose claims that they already own the USA, which is asinine. Uh, and by they, I mean, like, the Mexican governments. Apparently they already own the USA, which, again, that's asinine. And it's mentioned that they have ISIS soldiers in Mexico that they want to stop them from doing anything. Why are you pointing out your own plot holes, man? Like, th this this doesn't make sense. None of this makes sense. Like, it's constantly mentioned, like, oh yeah, the Mexican government is in on this, but then we have the Mexican government clearly not being in on it. Like, wh which is it? So they're going to set up an attempt to capture the terrorists before they enter the U.S. because apparently they care as much about the United States Constitution as Americans do. Like, th that's a weird idea that a lot of Americans have. Like, th this this idea that our Constitution is perfect and it's the envy of the whole world, and not, not really. Like, it, other countries have their own, for starters. Like, every other country has their own. And ours is, like, a good document, especially for the time period it was written in, but it's flawed. You know, that's why we've amended it 27 times. It's It's not perfect. It never was. And Jose never shows up again, and the Mexicans catching terrorists is never followed up on. Every abandoned house in Detroit represents an abandoned plot thread from this book. Chapter 9, Cartel Prisoners. So this is back with John, and he goes into flashback mode unprompted. And he thinks back to how his dad just wasn't in the picture, his mom raised him and his brother, his brother was an alcoholic, and then his brother committed suicide when he was, like, in his 20s, and... This is an attempt to humanize John, and it almost works, but it it never comes back in any way. You know, it, it's not uh, mentioned how, like, oh, he cares about the other Shadow Wolves like they're his brothers because his real brother died, and now he's super protective of them or anything like that. And, like, it's mentioned he loves his mom. Like, okay, that doesn't tell us much. You know, it, later his mom gets kidnapped, but she's not a real character. She, she's more of a MacGuffin that they fight over or anything, so we're, we're not attached to her. And you don't, if that's what you're going to do with it, you don't need to explain why John loves his mom. Like, most people will get it. It's also mentioned at this point that John, while he is an Indian and while he does live in Arizona right on the border, I don't believe it's ever specified what reservation he lives on because there's a couple, but he's not like a Navajo or an Apache or a Hopi or anything like that. He's a Mohawk. Why are Mo why is a Mohawk family living in Arizona? Like, it's not a problem, I guess, but it does raise questions. Like, they could literally just say, oh yeah, we moved here for our, our mom's job when we were younger, and like, that, that would be fine. Maybe the authors just don't know that the Mohawk live in the Northeast? And John thinks about his grandfather teaching him the old ways again, and they're just really vague so that the heroes can use them to do whatever the plot demands, and John talks to a prisoner. I think it's supposed to be Hoven, but he still hasn't told them what his name is, so it's he's still unnamed, and it's still hard to tell which one is which for that very reason. And he tells him that the other prisoners cut a deal, and they don't believe him. 
and then he takes all the prisoners to the Maricopa County Jail. Y you're supposed to give them over to federal custody. Okay, there, there are rules that law enforcement has to follow, otherwise these cases can get thrown out of court and pr criminal, cr yeah, criminals can walk free. Like, if, if they did this in real life, then the instant it went to trial, the judge would probably throw it out. And then John sees the ghost of his grandfather in the desert, and he's very surprised by it. Chapter 10, Death Sign. So, it starts with John trying to contact the reporter that, you know, left a pin up on his desk. Uh, her name is Maria, by the way. And he can't do it. Like, she's not answering her phone. And then, th that might work as a way of, like, building suspense. Like, we're thinking, oh no, something happened to Maria. Who killed her? What Was it because she was getting too close to figuring out what's going on? But then the book just immediately tells us what's wrong. I guess it's because suspense is a myth, like climate change or the female orgasm. So basically, some men uh, broke into Maria's hotel room, they killed her, and then they took her body out and dismembered it in the desert. On paper, this is a decent plot beat, but when you tell us everything up front, there's no time for us to wonder what's wrong or to watch John solving the mystery. Like, imagine if you were watching Citizen Kane, and it started off the same, like with people trying to figure out, like, oh, what does Rosebud mean? And then just a narrator explained it, like, oh yeah, Rosebud's a sled, but then we still spent the rest of the movie with the characters trying to solve the mystery. Like, that's basically what goes on here, because we have to watch John investigate this later. It's kind of impressive to fuck up on a level that basic, I'll be honest. Like, this is what I mean when I say a regular person couldn't write this. Like, a regular person would, on some level, realize, like, oh, that's a mistake, let's try and fix that up, clean it up. Like, they wouldn't necessarily do a good job of it, but they would at least attempt to, or they might have an editor that would help them clean it up at least, like... A, a normal person would do that, but these guys, Onision, they're not normal people. So right after Maria is killed, uh, Sweet Tooth and his brother, who's, his name is Jimmy, by the way, remember he's the one that's working with cartels and stuff, they go to visit her room because Maria apparently found out Jimmy was involved and called him because she wanted some information from him. And the thing is, if he's gonna do that, if he's gonna go visit this reporter, to talk about all the criminal activity he's been involved on, why would he bring his brother? Like, his brother doesn't know he's working for cartels. He might go blabbing, which is exactly what he does. Because everyone involved here is a dumbass. And Maria's not there, so they leave, and Sweet Tooth asks, like, hey, what, what'd you bring me over here for? And Jimmy lies and says that he was gonna meet a girl that he was dating? Why, why, why the fuck would you bring your brother there? What, why, I... I, I don't understand. Like, nope, we're, we're, we're moving. That's the end of the chapter. You know, a decent editor could probably cut this book down to a tweet. You know what? That's a lie. A decent editor would receive the manuscript for this, get 10 pages in, and then mail back a box of ashes. So John is driving with one of the prisoners, and he, he's talking to him, and he compares a country to a boat that can only hold a limited number of people, therefore we shouldn't allow immigrants in because that's bad. The thing is, if you actually believe that, then you would want to restrict the number of children that people have too, to prevent the population from going too much, but you aren't, so that says you don't actually believe that. Anyways, they bring the prisoner to one of the cops' house houses. He mentions that his bosses aren't Mexicans. We already knew that, the characters already knew that, this, you're just repeating yourself over and over again. And then they mention that he was recruiting people for them. So are they smuggling in jihadis, or are they using Americans to do their dirty work? Which, which one is it? So John sees his grandfather's ghost out in the desert again. Maybe, maybe he's just a paranoid schizophrenic, I, I don't know. Like, if seeing ghosts was just a thing that Shadow Wolves could do, then he shouldn't be surprised. But every time he sees his grandfather, he's shocked, like, whoa, it's grandpa! Like, it, it doesn't make sense. This is such a weird uh, plot thread that they bring up. Like, of all the plot threads to bring up and abandon, why did you stick with this one? And anyways, he talks to Armando, his boss, briefly. He promises to bring the prisoner in. We finally learn that the prisoner's name is Jaime. This might just be 
Hoven, he, like, he might have just changed his name, or this might be one of the other prisoners. I'm not sure, but they take him to the Maricopa County Jail, and they, they, they let him off. Like, there's just, that's it. And then that's the end of the chapter, and we get another chapter. It, you can see, it's just that much. It's just following a villain that has never been mentioned before, that we never see again, just for the sake of exposition for the audience. This one follows a guy named General Clapp. I could make a joke about that, but I, I'm not going to. And he says that they're moving up the timeline and that all the jihadis are there to perform a bunch of simultaneous terrorist attacks all over the country, which is not that much of a reveal, but okay, sure. And they call it Operation Paperclip 2, which is a dumb name. Like, Operation Paperclip, if you didn't know, was right after World War II, the American government brought in a bunch of, like, old Nazi scientists and such and gave them jobs and new identities and kind of laundered their reputation, basically. And as awful as that was, the, the point of it wasn't to kill Americans, so the name doesn't even make sense. And then General Clapp says they need to make life hell for any cop that tries to defend the Republic. Like, but no one talks like this. No one has ever talked like this. Plus, that's also not the police's job, by the way. Like, their job is to, at least on paper, is to enforce the law and keep the peace. Like, the military is the one for defending the country. Like, all this tells me is that Deputy Seagal thinks really highly of himself. Anyways, next chapter. Chapter 13, Deep State Shootout. So after dropping Jaime off at the county jail, St John comes home. He walked slowly through the pitch darkness of the desert night to the door of his home. He checked his surroundings visually and then stood in silence, listening to the rhythm of the night expressed by the desert creatures that lived mostly hidden all around him. He pulled his keys from his pocket and instinctually placed the house key in the lock without looking. He heard a door close in the back of the house as he walked in. Pulling his weapon, he ducked down and moved stealthily with the speed of an ocelot toward the noise, but when he arrived, he found nothing that could have caused it. He searched the area and then turned on a light before holstering his weapon. He walked into his bedroom and was stunned for a moment at the sight of Alicia lying across his bed with one of his shirts on, and that was about it. Hey, did I scare you, little boy? She threw her head back, releasing her long black hair, and gave a sultry sigh as she devoured him with her eyes. She waved him to her. Hey, baby, nice surprise. Almost got you killed, though. He smiled as he moved to her and sat down on the bed, slowly kicking off his boots. So apparently John has a girlfriend and it just, just wasn't mentioned before this because it's very impor important that Steven Seagal, sorry, it's very important that John, the main character of this book, who is not Steven Seagal, gets laid. Do you think he keeps his leather jacket on when they have sex? On the plus side, there are no awkward sex scenes in this book, which is better than a lot of terrible thrillers. So, yeah, it turns out that Alicia is also a tribal officer, and she was off on another assignment throughout the first part of this book. What assignment would keep her away from such important work is never specified, but okay. And then they get a call to bring Jaime back from the jail because he thinks he's about to be killed. So it's back to the jail. I love all this back and forth. I love it so much. So he decides to take Alicia with him as well because apparently she can also hold her own or whatever. What do you have for weaponry, woman? John asked, nodding towards Alicia's black canvas bag that she had placed on the floor in front of her before she jumped in the front seat next to him. I'm Mama Grizzly Bear Le ready, my love, she assured him. I would prefer Mama Grizzly Bear ass ready, but for now we'll go with what you got. He smiled, knowing his lady was way more than just a lady. She was fierce in any situation that required it. No question about that. She was a shadow wolf in every sense of the word. Hello, real human woman who talks just like a real human woman. How are you doing? Like, Seagal really thinks he's such a chad that he's just irresistible to women. <laughs> he actually believes that. Okay. And uh, so they go to the jail. And John calls his boss and asks to take Jaime out. And Armando asks him, like, well, where are you going to put him? And John says, I don't know where I'm going to put him. He just can't stay in the jail. And his boss agrees to it. That is not how that works. You, you can't just take... Pr 
uh, people in jail. I was about to say prisoners, but that's technically a different thing. But you can't just take people out of jail and take them wherever you want. That's not how that works. But anyways, uh, so they're driving in the desert, and then they get attacked by gunmen, and the fight is described with all the passion and intensity of nutrition facts on a can of beans. Four others rushed Alicia's position, pouring round after round as they did. Alicia wasn't there, though, as they soon found out when she appeared out of the darkness behind them and took all four out with strafing headshots. You can't claim that this book is a gritty depiction of the real world when the action feels like a bad video game. Like, hitting multiple targets in rapid succession while also moving quickly is so unlikely as to basically be impossible. And why were they standing in a line to begin with? Like, just, ugh, whatever, whatever, whatever. So Jaime gets shot and killed during the fighting. And then they call in other police to remove bodies and take statements from the couple of uh, gunmen that they were able to take prisoner. And Armando says, hey, Jaime's death is bringing me heat from the feds. Yes, yes it would, because you took somebody out of the jail when you weren't supposed to, and then you got them killed. Like, this would result in John being fired, if not arrested, for getting somebody killed. Like, he broke at least one law here. And unless the police union decided that they wanted to keep cops who break the rules and get people killed around, which is likely, that's what police unions are for. Uh, so, Armando talks a little bit about how cool John and Alicia are. Alright, doesn't, doesn't really mean anything. And they realize somebody is listening in on their communications, and that's how people knew where they were, where they were going, and so they decide to be careful with that, and they're going to use code words from now on. They also mention that the cartels have more Mex money than the Mexican government. Like, may maybe combined, but they aren't all one entity. You know, there's a bunch of different cartels. They're criminal organizations. They kill each other all the time. But... Alright, we've already established that this doesn't take place in the real world, even if it pretends to. So that's the end of that chapter, and then we go to another flashback chapter. Chapter 14, Exit Strategy. So, we see Jimmy going to see his mother, and his mother's a cleaning lady at an Indian casino, and then he goes off with a bad guy for some nefarious purpose. And that is it. That is, that is the whole chapter. That's everything. We'll go to the next chapter now, because... That last one wasn't needed, so let's just, let's, let's, the Shadow Wolves are at a diner now. And Agent Wilson is angry at John for getting his prisoner killed, which is understandable. Like, or actually, if Agent Wilson was just a regular federal officer, it would be understandable why he'd be mad about this. But he was trying to make sure that Jaime didn't give up any information. Like, isn't this a good thing? Like, if he's dead, he can't give up any information. Like, this... This helps you, Wilson. Why are you so mad? And so, John uh, threatens Wilson, and Wilson's unimpressed. I suppose that's a threat, Geronimo. You got me crapping in my pants. Can't you see me shaking and shitting? He looked at his fellow agents, who were laughing loudly, until John stood up slowly. He was several inches taller than Wilson, who was, by now, looking up at him. I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. Just like Billy Jack did in the movie when he was dealing with his asshole antagonist. John went tiger face, a martial arts method of draining all expression from one's face. Oh, here I thought Seagal was just a terrible actor. Turns out he's using ancient Chinese techniques. Wait, I already said that. So did this fucking book. Repetition is fun. So they have a very short fight. John wins easily because obviously the hero can never struggle. Like, Wilson literally hurts himself more than John when he punches him. And then... He says, hey, get the fuck out of this diner. If you come back, we're going to have you arrested and put up in front of a tribal judge, and that tribal judge is definitely going to find you guilty. Which is not how that works. Like, in most circumstances, tribal law only applies to tribal members. Like, unless Agent Wilson is secretly a member of the tribe, which I don't think he is, then it probably wouldn't do anything. Yeah, whatever, whatever. And besides, if they had a native judge and they could uh, prove that there was clear bias demonstrated, then he could probably get off on appeals. And the thing is, that threat might work as an excuse. It, it might, Even if it doesn't really feel like it could happen in reality, it might work as an excuse 
for why Wilson would be intimidated and leave. But then the narrator comes right out and says that Wilson couldn't do anything because of political correctness. Yeah, as, as we all know, the police never arrest minorities for any crime ever, nor do they ever harass them unnecessarily. Pay no attention to Arpaio being found guilty of racial profiling, or how police kill American Indians at a higher rate than any other racial group. Plus, Wilson keeps calling him Geronimo, so I, I don't think he cares about political correctness. Chapter 16, The Coffee Pot. So John's Shadow Wolf mentor, whose name is Sunday, and has also never been mentioned before, uh, and apparently he works undercover at a casino, he gives him a call. Uh, also, why, like, why would a DEA agent work undercover at a cons casino? Like, I can imagine some scenarios where they might do that, but the book never brings it up. It's not like, oh yeah, they were, we thought they might be laundering money for cocaine traffickers. Like, it, th that would make sense, but they never bring it up. Anyways, it's, it's the ca casino, which is attached to the hotel where Maria was staying, and so John goes there, they search her room, and this is what I mentioned before. We have to watch John and Sunday investigate the murder, even though we already know everything that went down. So we're just sitting here going, come on, hurry up, get, get through this. And the room has been cleaned, which implies that the villains are professionals, but they never act like professionals outside of this one scene. And they also know that something is wrong, not because the, Maria is missing, and, which is what would tip me off, but the spirit energy of the room is disturbed. So that's how they know what's going on. All right. So John, uh, while they're searching around, goes to make a cup of coffee, and in the coffee machine he finds a flash drive hidden in there. Y yeah, he's he's the only one that likes coffee. No one else would ever search there. And wh why would you make coffee in this situation anyways? Like, you're at a crime scene. You don't want to contaminate things, which you might do if you're if you have food or drink there. But all right, um, I will give some small amount of credit that this was foreshadowed. It's actually been mentioned multiple times uh, before this that John really likes coffee. Uh, so there you go, one, one point in this book's favor. Like, they do know how to set things up before they happen. Awesome. So Sunday and John go to the surveillance room, watch some security footage, and they notice some men taking Maria's body out in a suitcase, which, imagine if we hadn't gotten the chapter following her death and John had just shown up here and they had to look around and find her, find her missing and go through the security footage and everything, Th this investigation would actually have been a bit tense because we're a bit worried for her. We're wondering, like, oh, who killed her? Why? Or maybe she's not dead. Maybe she was just kidnapped. Or, like, something's going on here. And it, it would have been a bit surprising, and it would have made the character seem smart, too, but instead it's just repeating what we already know. And I'm just sitting here thinking, my God, can we, can we move on, please? Somebody? And then they look at the contents of the flash drive. Um, conveniently, it just has Maria reading off all the findings from the story she's been working on. You know, they don't have to dig through a ton of notes or anything else that might cause them to have to work in order to save the day. But, you know, they go over a bunch of stuff we already know. Bad guys are bringing in terrorists to commit terrorist attacks. Like, again, if we hadn't already known that, this might have been some sort of big reveal. But we did already know that. Uh, it also doesn't go over what evidence Maria collected, but we've established that evidence is for pussies who base their beliefs on facts and logic. It's mentioned that they've been bringing in a thousand jihadis a month for seven years, and they've been getting away with it because they're shielded by judges, lawyers, CEOs, and doctors. I'm not sure what doctors would do in this situation. And if, if a thousand are coming in every month, after seven years, there would be 84,000 jihadis in the United States. You don't need that many people to do terrorism. Like, 9-11 was done with 19 hijackers. They, they, they did that much damage with less than 20 guys. Like, that, that's the whole point of terrorism, is that you have inferior manpower and inferior firepower, so you're trying to do as much damage as possible with very few resources. And then... Even with this huge, ludicrous number of people, uh, in the climax they go over all the planned attacks. But they go over all the attacks and they mention like a couple dozen terrorists at most who were involved in the operation. So what were the other 83,500 for? And how did they keep a city's worth of people secret up until now? Like, 
The Soviet spy ring in the United Kingdom during the Cold War was completely unraveled because one of them got drunk and started blabbing to the police. And that was like a hundred people. Like it only takes one dude to make the whole thing uh, fall apart. If you have 84,000, this would have happened a long time ago. And then again, Sunday explains how everyone in the government is in on the conspiracy because everyone is out to get you. It's so hard being an old, wealthy white man, two-thirds of whom were formerly in the government themselves, or currently in the government. The idea that everyone in government that you dislike is working together to destroy you is both paranoid and stupid. Like, you know, you can't just think like, oh, they're incompetent, or oh, they, I disagree with them. Like, no, they're, they're obstacles to you being in control of all things, therefore they're evil, and therefore they're all secretly on the same side. And then Sunday goes on about how uh, President Barack Obama has himself brought in members of the Muslim Brotherhood, Hezbollah, and ISIS. Look, I I'm not going to defend those groups because they're all pretty nasty, but they all fucking hate each other. Like, similar to the cartels I mentioned earlier, they fight and kill each other all the time. Like, it, to give you one example, like the I yeah, ISIS are Sunni Muslims. Hezbollah are Shia Muslims. Th they don't always get along, those two groups. Uh, there's tons of examples of ISIS straight up committing massacres and other attacks on Shiites because, oh, you're the wrong religion, bang, bang. Like, oftentimes they hate Shiites more than they hate people of non-Muslim religions. Like, some of their fe fiercest opponents in Iraq were Shiite militias, and then some of those militias later went on to abuse Sunni populations that they liberated. Uh, if you don't believe me that there's some animosity between those two groups, here's an Egyptian cooking show host openly fantasizing about killing them all. حتى لو كنت أنت رجل شيعي وحتى لو كنت أنت بتعتقد اعتقاد غير اعتقاد المسلمين فيجب احترام المسلمين يا ندل. فاحنا في الطاهي بتاعي وخلينا في النمج الطاهي ولكن عايز أقول لك حاجة واحدة بس والكل الشيعة على التصل يعني لو صار حد تصل ما تصلش بلاش بلاش كفاية كفاية يعني كفاية اللي في قلبنا من ناحيتكم فما بلاش تكتروه يعني خلونا كده ساكتين عليكم لان لو في حكم اسلامي صح لو في حكم اسلامي صح يعني انتوا مش هكون لكم موجود ان شاء الله memory tv is wild man look you don't have to be an expert to know that the sunni shia split is a thing you do have to do 30 seconds of fucking research and then in addition to those groups all working together despite hating each other they're also working with the cartels the mexican government the us government the saudi government and iran and uh, that's not all at once that comes out over the course of the book, but like all those groups are working together. And I don't know, possibly Pakistan as well, and they never bring that back up. And again, these groups are all often at odds with each other, if not outright hostile, and killing each other. Like the US government and Iran. Yeah, those are best of friends. Like, ugh. and again, just the idea that everyone you hate is on the same side is how a child views the world. Okay, reality is much more complex than that. I also dislike most of these organizations. I'm not stupid enough to think that they would set aside differences and just to attack me because I'm that important. Uh, and then he claim talks about how Barack Obama is hiding his birth certificate, which is factually untrue. I'm just going to start throwing more stuff like that out there for, to save time. Like, they're going to mention something, I'm just going to say, yeah, that's factually untrue, rather than going into detail about it because... Sometimes that's all you can say. And quite frankly, I, I hate to sound like I'm defending Barack Obama because I have plenty of criticisms of my own, but he was born in the United States and he was born to an American mother. Like if you can't accept that, it's probably because you just hated having a black guy in charge. Like you're trying to paint him as some nasty foreigner for that reason. It all, they also imply that the cartels own the media despite the media constantly showing cartels as being murderers, which, like, rightfully so. Like, uh, again, media is not one entity. It, there's a lot of things that could be considered uh, the media, and I, have, I can't think of a single example of cartels being portrayed sympathetically anywhere. Next chapter. Noach tells John that the tooth he found near the beginning of the book belonged to a woman who was investigating government corruption. Yeah, I forgot about that part too. You know, like, if that had come up at the beginning of the book, or near the beginning of the book, 
and they had gone, hey, we looked into that tooth, and turns out uh, the woman who uh, it belonged to, she was researching government corruption, and she just disappeared a couple of weeks ago. Like, that would, that, that would be a good way to start things off, but they just kind of forgot about it until just now. And, uh, and anyways, a woman named Sheila comes up to John and tries to have sex with him because he's just that much of a chad, and then he rebuffs her because he's in a relationship with Alicia, obviously, and then she tries to kill him because she was secretly an assassin. And that's the end of the chapter. We're, we're, we're about halfway done. Chapter 18, Jihad in the Desert. So this one, the Shadow Wolves ambush some cars in the desert, they kill some bad guys, they capture some more of them, and then they interrogate them. I'm so glad to repeat this plot point. Uh, and then John's talking to one of them, and he whispers something in Arabic, which is a uh, Suih Bukhara? I, 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 don't, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, I apologize if it's wrong, but uh, it, it means war is deceit, and it's a quote that's often attributed to the Prophet Muhammad. And the man he's speaking to just freaks the fuck out and starts asking, Is this a test? Is this a test? Like, yeah, a deep cover operative who spent years pretending to be Mexican would panic when someone gives him something that sounds like a coded message. Like, that that's who you want working on your side. Plus, it wouldn't make sense for this to be a test because the cops just killed several of them. Like, what? Why would you test members of your organization by killing a couple of them and then capturing the others and trying to see if they give anything up? That just, that's so counterproductive. That's stupid. And then John just examines the weapons that they confiscated from them. Looks like somebody died today, Arlo commented quietly. Guns have a way of making that happen, don't they? He looked from face to face for a response. He was several inches shorter than John, but moved like a man who knew where he was going and how to get there. There are a lot of unnecessary ellipses in this book. I, like, does Steven Seagal think that they make everything more dramatic? Because they're just weird and awkward. It's nice of them to reassure us that Steven Seagal is in fact a big, sorry, that John is in fact a big man. And anyways, basically while he's examining the weapons, he, um, he just talks to a friend on the radio and asks him to hack into the ATF database to track the weapons, which is, like, that, that's not something you can do. You can't just hack into a government website like that. You can't just hit control alt shift and then, oh, you're in. Like, that, that's not how hacking works. That's never been how it works. And if the bad guys, if they didn't either get their weapons illegally, like on the black market, or if they didn't buy them legally and then file off the serial numbers so that they can't get tracked, they deserve to lose because they're idiots. They, they don't even do, like, the bare minimum to prevent to cover their tracks. Like, they're, they're idiots and they deserve to lose, if that's the case. So John just takes all the weapons, puts them in a bag, and loads them up in his car for chain of custody reasons. L look, if you're unaware, uh, chain of custody is basically just protocol that law enforcement has to follow when they're uh, dealing with evidence of crimes. Like, basically, it's to make sure that evidence isn't lost or tampered with. Like, they always have to track who has it, where it is, and what's done to it. And if you don't turn the guns into evidence immediately, like if the crime, if you don't bag it up right away, and I, I don't mean in like a duffel bag, I mean in those special plastic bags and then you log it all. If you don't already do that, then chain of custody is already broken and that evidence is inadmissible in court. Now, you might also be thinking that, oh, okay, John just grabbed a bunch of guns and is holding on to them. Maybe this is hinting that there's going to be a fight later and he's going to have to use all his new guns to shoot his way out of it. No, it never comes back up. Never ever. It's also revealed that John can see footprints on rocks physically and metaphorically, whatever that means. Um, he never uses that ability, so all right. And then he spends some time talking about how the Mexican government is propped up by the Sinaloa cartel, which is just stupid. Like, okay, okay which, which of these makes more sense? The cartel funnels money into the government to keep it functioning, or they just bribe a couple of cops and other officials to look the other way. Like, which of those is cheaper, more effective, and less likely to be discovered? It's the second one. You don't, you don't need to uh, think about that too hard. But he also says that cartels are paid by jihadis to help them cross the border, and 
Again, I already mentioned, like, they're killing off their own customer base, that doesn't make sense. And if they really have all this money, the jihadis could just build a regular army? And... okay, and apparently they've been finding copies of the Quran spread across the desert for years. You probably should have mentioned that earlier if that was the case. But even then, that's stupid, because if you're hiding the fact that you're Muslim, you're probably not going to carry a Quran around everywhere. Do, like, do you spend any time thinking about this, these things at all? Do you spend any time? So he decides that they can't trust anybody other than other shadow wolves. So they call them in from across the country because every Indian tribe has shadow wolves. Because they're all the same, I guess. Like, this is really not how that works, but whatever. And then... The next day, John goes to the jail to pick up the men that he arrested early in the book again. This thing repeats more than Groundhog's Day. So, Wilson gets there right after him and he misses his prisoners and he's very upset. And John gets chewed out by his boss over the phone, but he doesn't change course. He's like a shitty, loose cannon cop from a terrible movie which is half of Steven Seagal's movies, really. And John makes a note to call a U.S. Marshal whose name is Eric Kahn. Now, this comes completely out of nowhere. Like, Eric Kahn is the head marshal for all of Arizona. And he's very clearly a self-insert for Tom Morrissey, who was also a U.S. Marshal in Arizona at some point, because they make sure to point out how cool and respected Kahn is. And then John interrogates more fucking prisoners. Uh, the, the main prisoner, who he talked to in Arabic briefly, his name is Gato. He's still unsure if John is testing him or not, because he's a fucking idiot. Like, I, either he was lying because he killed your friends, and it wouldn't make sense for them to do that if they were just testing you, or he's telling the truth because he was speaking to you in Arabic. Like, first one is much more likely, but it's one of those two things. And then John's shadow wolf mentor, whose name is Sunday, is assassinated in the parking lot outside the casino. It happens very quickly over the course of about a paragraph. It's hard to feel anything for him. So, all right. Um, and then John sees his grandpa's ghost again, and he pulls a gun, but then he puts it away. But Alicia sees it, and she's like, John, who are you talking to? There's no one there. And he's like, I thought I saw some. And they, he kind of dodges the question, really. I have a question for you, though. If your boyfriend was seeing people who aren't there, and talking about government conspiracies against him, would you go along with his plans, or would you assume he had mental problems and get him help? Because I know which one I would do, but I don't know, maybe that's just me. I, I want to hear from others. So John offers Gato some food, asks him if he wants some pulled pork, and Gato is physically repulsed. He's like, oh, I would never have pork. And he catches himself, um, I, uh, I don't like pork very much. It upsets my stomach. Like, if you're this bad at blending in, if these terrorists are this bad at blending in, they would have been caught a long time ago. Like, this book is trying so hard to make John seem smart, and he just, he isn't. He is not, and he never has been. Plus, like, Muslims aren't allowed to eat pork, but most of them aren't going to have that kind of reaction to being offered it. They're probably just going to say, no thanks, I don't eat that. Like, like Jews aren't allowed to have pork either. Go, go and... Ask a Jewish person if they'd like pork, they'd probably react the same way, like, no thanks, I, like, I don't know why people think it's so much different. And then we cut to Agent Wilson, who is flying a Predator drone over the Shadow Wolf headquarters, and he doesn't see anything, even though the Shadow Wolves are hidden in the brush around the, the building. So, uh, hold on, are you telling me that he has the whole government behind him. Like, he's part of this massive conspiracy involving the entire military and government and all them, and they can't get him a drone with thermal imaging? Like, and... Or are the Shadow Wolves just masking their heat? Is that a thing? I... I don't know, man. And, plus, the thing is, the, the narrator tells us that the Shadow Wolves are hidden. Like, it just straight up says, Oh, Wilson didn't see the, them, but they were hidden there, like, so it's not any surprise to us when they pop up. Like, if we didn't know what was going on either, and Wilson was just flying around and going, Oh, I don't see any of them, then when they pop up a minute later, it would make them seem a lot cooler and a lot smarter for fooling the villain. 
So Gacho is still unsure if he's being tested for a while, it takes a while, but eventually he decides John is trustworthy. He reveals he's actually a double agent and he's working against the terrorists. Who is he working for? It's never specified. Just some foreign government, that's it. And I think it might be Mexico based on that uh, chapter with Jose earlier, but it's never confirmed, nor is much information given, so it's hard to figure out. So they spend some more time fear-mongering. The entire White House is members of the Muslim Brotherhood. They give weapons to terrorists on purpose, etc. Would really make more sense for the terrorists to just buy weapons once they get to the US, but we've established there's no logic to any of this. And then Gato says that the Shadow Wolves are the only national group of warriors that can be trusted to defend America. Um, that feels a little weird to me. Cause like, if anything, Indians have more reason to hate the U.S. government than pretty much anyone else, like both for historical reasons and modern ones. Like, shouldn't the terrorists be trying to recruit them, if anything? Like, I'm not trying to imply that Indians are all chomping at the bit to kill white people or anything, but you could probably find a few extremists among them if you looked. Or, hell, maybe you could just radicalize a few of them yourself if you put in the effort. Like, that, that, that would make more sense here. Then he spends some time in... Uh, implying that ISIS agents are highly trained special forces and if they're old propaganda videos or anything to go off of no like even through the magic of video editing they couldn't make themselves look like the special forces badasses they were trying to it just it, they failed at it and they also reveal that the terrorists like to party in the desert we already knew that John thought for a moment and said the one thing that jumps out at me is how Muslims and Catholics can mix together it's not something that seems like it would go down too easily it all comes down to money. The jihadists have plenty of it, and the Catholics who are working with them want plenty of it. As long as that's a factor, the whole thing works. The people who are being victimized there are the peons who have to work for these tyrants. But that is where the chink could develop in their armor. Am I am I detecting some anti-Catholic hate there? Like, I, I mean, I normally wouldn't think too much about that, but this book honestly has a lot of bigotry towards several different groups, so I... I, I have to think, like, is there, is there some... I, I, there's some Catholic hate coming off of that, but... I don't know, whatever. I already went over the issues with Jihadi Cartel Alliance. Uh, it's revealed that the big cartel boss in this operation is a guy named Antonio Septuan, and he beheads people to get his point across sometimes. And then they immediately repeat that he kills people to get his point across. Like, look, I friggin' marked it there. You can see... It's that much space between repeating things. I hate this book. And then next chapter. Wilson, Agent Wilson, sends some men to kidnap John's mother. And they just knock on the door and then this happens. A few seconds later they heard, Can I help you? Emma Goad sleepily stood slightly behind a half-open door. The half-smile on her face disappeared instantly as she took in the sight of the weapons pointed at her. Oh no! She yelled as she tried to slam the door, but it was futile as they rushed through, knocking her down. Yeah, that's... that's how humans react. And John immediately knows that something is wrong because he's perfect. And then they just... they let Gato escape, but they take the other prisoners back to jail. This is half the goddamn book. I swear, this is half the book. It's just going back and forth between the jail and somewhere else with prisoners. So Wilson follows John, and he tells the drone pilot not to kill him. I'm not sure why he tells him that, no reason is ever given, but... You know, he, he doesn't take his opportunity to kill him and prevent the one threat to their plans from... Okay, okay. So then John gets another call from Sweet Tooth, and he tells him that his brother Jimmy managed to warn him that the terrorists are going to blow up the casino where their mom works in an attempt to make us give a shit about any of this, because, like, Jimmy and Sweet Tooth's mom is barely a character. I don't even know if her name is ever said. Like, why should I care about her? Like, if you want us to care about people that are in danger, like, you kind of have to make a side character that's likable and then have them at the casino for some reason. Anyways, uh, that's... That's the end of that chapter, so we get to chapter 23, Dead Reporter Talks, and this is a flashback. You see, we just learned that Jimmy warned his brother about this, but this is the flashback to 
when Jimmy warned his brother about this. So we, we're following Jimmy warning his brother about this. I still have 60 fucking pages left of this. Okay, the short version. Jimmy is brought out to this compound out in the middle of the desert by a boss man named Maloof. Now, Maloof chastises him for a minute for being concerned about his mother being in the line of fire because Jimmy's like, wait, my mom works at that casino. Do we have to blow that up? And like, why would Maloof... Maloof, he's a kid that you paid to do some small jobs. He's not a jihadi. Like, why would you... One, why would you tell him about this? And two, why would you expect him to be okay with his mother being killed? Like, I don't even think most jihadis would be okay with their mother being killed in a terrorist attack that they had something to do with. I don't think they would want to do that. Uh, but then Maloof forces Jimmy to convert to Islam, and then he just kind of lets him go. Like, he, he lets him have a phone and everything, and he doesn't keep him under arm guard. He just sort of lets this guy who knew, knows about their terrorist attack and has very good reason to want to try to stop it or warn people about it, he just lets him go. Makes perfect sense. And then Jimmy goes and calls Sweet Tooth and warns him. So, we're supposed to believe that the villains are all-knowing and all-powerful and everywhere, but they're also just woefully incompetent. Like, they're so strong and so weak at the same time. It's, it's really interesting. I swear I've heard that somewhere before. Now, it's also revealed that the bomb at the casino is a dirty bomb that will spread a giant cloud of radiation all across the southwest. Now, at first, I thought it was stupid that they were attacking such a small target, like, oh, it's just some casino. Like, who, who gives a shit about that? Especially compared to some of the other attacks they'll mention, which are much bigger. But that, that makes sense now. Like, a, a dirty bomb would affect millions of people and possibly kill millions of people, cause untold economic damage. That's obviously secondary to the dead people, but, you know, either way, it's, it would be a big deal. And in fact, that would probably be the biggest attack in American history. The book should have just been about stopping the dirty bomb plot. Like, because it later mentions that there are simultaneous attacks on places like the Statue of Liberty, the Sears Tower, the Las Vegas Strip, the Brooklyn Bridge, and each of these barely get a paragraph dedicated to them in total. And, like, it's better for stories to go deeper into events rather than wide and cover a bunch of events. Like, a lot of things happening is meaningless if none of them sink in and we don't care about them. Also this... It was his greatest achievement in life to have gotten this far, so close to the heart of the great Satan, and now standing poised with a scepter at the ready to behead this supreme evil. How are you going to behead someone with a scepter? So John gets a call from the men who kidnapped his mother. They tell him to drop the flash drive off that he got from Maria's room. Uh, they tell him to drop it off at the casino, and his mom will go free. Then he gets another call from Sweet Tooth, who heard from Jimmy that his mom is being held in a cave because... Who would ever want to watch a detective investigate anything? Just give him all the answers. It, like, it's not even a gut feeling this time. Like, oh, I think my mom's being held out in the desert. It's not Shadow Wolf powers either. It's just, here's, here's the answers. Here you go. Go nuts. So they gather up 38 Shadow Wolves from all over the country for the operation. They meet up with Jimmy, and he leads them off to the cave. And John inquires about his mom in a weird way. Did she look like she was hurt? John asked tersely. Jimmy didn't want to be the bearer of bad news, but there was no reason to lie about it to make John feel better. She looks like shit, man. He thought about it for a minute and then said, I don't mean no disrespect, John Goad, and I think that your mother is a pretty lady and all, but she don't look too good right now. Oh, well, as long as you're being polite. Robert, just like old Tom, huh? Me saving your life and your hooker girl flying up into the wind. I didn't choose a good time to film this. The lighting is not great. So then we have another chapter. And John spends the entirety of that chapter talking about Eric Kahn. Remember the U.S. Marshal who, who was just so cool and amazing from earlier. And he tries to convince him to help them. And then Kahn deputizes all the Shadow Wolves. And I refuse to spend any more time on that. Chapter 27. Shadow Wolves fight for America's future. They came together as John explained the strategy he felt would render the best results in rescuing his mother. Was this written by an AI? So they get ready to attack the cave. Meanwhile, Maloof is preparing to do terrorist stuff, and just Seagal continues to show off how much of a dumbass he is. 
confidence within their ranks had grown exponentially as their caliphate grew in Syria and neighboring Iran due to the American retreat as they saw it. Iran and Iraq are two different countries. Stephen, Thomas, Joseph. They're, they're not the same place. I get that it's one letter off. I get that they're close. But they are very different countries that, that don't get along. They actually fought the deadliest war since World War II against each other in the 80s. And Iran does not border Syria. It's not Syria's neighbor. This is why you have an editor. So the Shadow Wolves infiltrate the cave, and the way they do that is by shooting a guard outside the cave, which would probably make a very loud gunshot, and that guard doesn't die though. Some others come out of the cave to investigate and they say, hey, why are you screaming? And then they get shot themselves, because they're idiots. And then they sneak into the cave with their shadow wolf powers and they kill the rest of them. And a man named Kazi or Kazi is holding John's mom captive. And so John has to fight him hand to hand because he's just that cool. And he taunts him by saying he dipped his knife and his bullets in pig's blood. It's, it's not garlic to vampires, dude. No, most of them probably wouldn't care. And right after the fight is over, Gato shows back up and he holds up a cross and he says, they treat it like vampires. Like, no, they, they don't. They really don't. And in fact, the book kind of backs me up on that because Kazi doesn't show any reaction to it throughout the whole fight. So John defeats him through the epic power of throat punches and making ghost moves to evade Kazi's attacks. And he rescues his mom and they're like, okay, now we just need to find the other terrorists and stop all their attacks. So he talks to Marshal Khan and Khan reveals that there are officers in the US military who are secretly working against the government. And they're like the good guys. That, that's called a coup, you fucking idiot. Like, the, the military is not the government. It's not supposed to be the government. It is not the state. It is a tool of the state. When it starts acting and doing whatever it wants and acting on its own, democracy and the constitution that you claim to care about so much are already dead. That doesn't just apply to presidents that you like or dislike. That applies to everybody. Full stop. If you ever say but at any point, then you don't actually care about the republic that you claim to love so much. You're just trying to gain more power for yourself. And this, this would be the deep state that you claim to hate so much. This small, elite, unelected group of people who are actively defying the will of the country. That's the, the deep state that you're so afraid of. So after hearing that, John has to convince Khan that he's a true American patriot. So he tells him that his Mohawk ancestors fought in the American Revolution. The Mohawk fought for the British, you dense pile of lard. A quantum computer running calculations for a year could not even begin to fathom how proud these people are of their ignorance and stupidity. Noach asked in his usual stoic manner, I wonder who it is that's going to clean up that mess. He nodded his head towards the body strewn about him. We don't have time to deal with it right now. There are many other important things lying ahead of us. Besides, they won't know the difference. Don't think time matters to them anymore, John said quietly, respecting the fact that he had just killed a small group of men. You were just taunting one of them with pig's blood. I don't think... Th that's not what a thoughtful, reluctant warrior does. I don't know how much Morrissey was paid to ghostwrite this, but it was too goddamn much. Anyways, it's revealed that Bellamy, who, remember, the shadow wolf from the beginning who can defeat anyone just by believing in it, uh, he was a mole this entire time. Like, he was sending information to the bad guys, and he's actually going to the hospital where John's mother was taken, and he's gonna kill her. And Maloof and the other terrorists set up a massive party in the desert with lights and everything. Like, very subtle. You're, you're, very, you're doing a very good job at hiding. Like, just, just rent a house or something. You know, just rent a house in some neighborhood. It can be a neighborhood out of the way, certainly, or just a house that's out of the way, but like, just rent or buy that, you certainly have the money for it, and then throw your parties there. Like, if it's out in the middle of the desert, you're gonna attract a lot more attention. So, uh, it briefly cuts to Bellamy about to kill John's mother. Alicia shows up and shoots him. It's a good thing we shuffled the only notable woman character away from the final battle. Like, the, 
Does any piece of media fail the Bechdel test worse than this one? Chapter 29, Ghost Warriors. So this just starts with a description of all the planned terrorist attacks across the country. Like I said, they're attacking like the Sears Tower, Brooklyn Bridge, the New York Stock Exchange, etc. And most of them are like just, you know, regular terrorist attacks. They don't stand out that much. But the Brooklyn Bridge plan is really stupid because their plan is to drive a truck full of explosives onto the bridge, then jump out, drive away on a scooter to a safe distance, and then detonate the explosives. Like, that's a horrible plan. As a horrible plan. If, if you saw that, your immediate thought would probably be, oh shit, terrorists. Like, it's like if someone was uh, going to the subway and then the doors are closing, they throw a bag in and run away. Like, you just immediately assume, oh shit, it's a bomb. Like, if there are any cops nearby when they do this, they would immediately be caught. Like, if you're going to do something like that, it would kind of have to be a suicide bomb. And then there's some whining about how Arab people were given jobs as janitors when they were rightfully promised to American veterans, like, fuck off, man. You're, you're just making things up, convincing yourself it's real, and then getting pissed off about it now. That's actually this book in a nutshell, now that I'm, now that I'm thinking about it. And anyways, we go back to the party, where some uh, Middle Eastern music is playing, and there are women going around kissing multiple men. God, those filthy harlots. Filthy harlots kissing multiple men. So awful. Uh, they're so bad, bad girls. So awful. I can't believe that you would put something like that in this book, meant for good, God-fearing Christian Americans, sir. Think carefully next time. God, I am losing my mind over this. I'm, I'm just so tired. I, I'm very close to the end, guys, I promise. I just, I really want this to be over. <laughs> so... The Shadow Wolves find the camp, obviously, because it's a big frickin' beacon in the middle of the desert, and uh, John manages to sneak in. John moved like a spirit toward and behind the prone figure who was observing a span in front of him that somehow did not include John Goad. Do I even... Uh, okay, I just, I'm almost done, I'm almost done. Steven Seagal got bullied a lot as a kid, didn't he? I, I feel like he did, but... So they go in, they kill all the terrorists, including Agent Wilson, and they capture Maloof, and he refuses to tell them where the attacks are going to happen. And in order to get him to talk, John throws him into a pit full of rattlesnakes to talk, and eventually he gives in, in a rather, a rather interesting way. Look, look at what you've done. I'm going to die. The pain is unbelievable. It's very bad. Do something, Ali shouted. <sighs> <gasps> We've got a lot of work to do. Someone help me! I I'm still alive, only I'm very badly burned! Look, guys, tor torture doesn't work, okay? It, it only makes people tell you what they think you want to hear, okay? And I know, I don't care how many movies you've seen or anything where torture works, like, reality is not on your side. I hate to break it to you. Like, if you want information, you have to interrogate it out of people, and there's some very interesting psychological uh, methods that they use to do that, but, like, torture doesn't work. It just doesn't. So he tells John everything, and then John sends out all the information. And then, uh, at some point later, we reenact that scene from the beginning of the book where John is dancing with spirits in the desert, and he's surrounded by men, and then he hides. Like... I guess that was an in medias res opener, sort of. Like, this whole thing was a flashback. I didn't realize it until now. That tends to happen when everything is exactly like everything else, and when the main character does not change at all throughout the whole book. And anyways, then we go to the epilogue, which is only two pages. It's really just a brief explanation of how all the attacks were stopped, except, wait, no, most of them weren't. Like, they stopped the dirty bomb from going off in Arizona, but all of the other attacks either still happened, or they happened and they were kind of mitigated. So, like, dozens of people were still killed. So, the heroes did all of this shit, all of this shit, and they still only partially succeeded. You spent this entire book making it clear how awesome 
and cool and smart John and the rest of the Shadow Wolves are, and then you had them fail at 80% of what they set out to do. How, how do you drop the ball this hard? I'm genuinely at a loss. Like, how do you drop the ball and give us an ending this awful? That, that's kind of impressive. Literally all you had to do was just say like, all the attacks were stopped and very few people died or no one died. And it would be like, oh, okay, happy ending. Like John did a great job. He's, he's a hero. Like that's another reason why it would have been better and more believable if, like I said earlier, the story was just about stopping the dirty bomb in Arizona. Like the, the heroes would have succeeded then. And then there's a brief passage about how the, quote, former president, who's obviously Barack Obama, was in damage control mode and trying to discredit his successor. Apparently he's paying rioters to destroy stuff. Well, if that's the case, where's my fucking check? And plus, I thought Barack Obama was president during all of this. Like, that's why you kept saying the White House was full of evil Muslims and stuff. Like, unless you're saying that his successor was actually the one behind all of this and I just misread all the stuff about his birth certificate and being half white, like, you, it's not that difficult to keep continuity, guys. It really isn't. So, John becomes the first American Indian U.S. Marshal for Arizona, except, oh wait, they call him the first Native American uh, U.S. Marshal for Arizona. And here I thought only politically correct dumbasses use the term Native American. And just, that's, that's it. That's the end. I would say, what a journey, but honestly, there, there was no journey in this book. Like, some folks got shot, and then some other folks got shot, and John already knows everything without having to work for it, and then he sort of saves the day without struggling. Like, it, it doesn't even get that crazy or anything, for the most part. Like, at least in shit like Reaper's Creek, the world and the characters change over the course of the book. And like that that's what every story is when you think about it. It's a tale of change, like a change in the world or a change in characters or something like that. And nothing changes in this. There's genuinely nothing good here. Like I, I cannot think of a single plot point or a moment in the story that I liked. And not even like, I hate this cliche and I try not to use it, but like, not even in the sense of like, oh, that was kind of a good idea, they just had a bad execution for it. Like, no nothing. There was nothing here. Any improvements that I could make to this book would involve going back in time to prevent it from being written. Uh, the plot's obviously full of holes, like the whole Pakistanis and Arabs are the same thing, but then forgetting all about the Pakistanis, or the changing number of jihadis, and quite frankly, what were the other 84,000 for? Like, what, and what happened to them? They... They're all over the country, like, what What happened? Like, eh, okay, and uh, the world is just a reflection of the author's views on our own world. And it still doesn't make any real sense. Like, at no point during writing did they realize that something didn't add up and they didn't make any alterations because they're incapable of self-reflection. Like, they were incapable of looking through this and realizing, oh, we're kind of contradicting ourselves and not only changing something in the book, but maybe doing some introspection and realizing, eh, you know what, maybe some of my beliefs aren't totally logical. Let's, let's change it. Like, that's something all people should do at some point, but some people are incapable of it. And it accidentally lets us know exactly how insecure they are about things like their height, their weight, their place in society, how attractive they are to women. Like, just all of their baggage is worn so proudly on their sleeves. It's so weird. And, um, moving away from story, there's not a single character that I liked anywhere here. Not a single one of them has any personality, any depth, or any likability whatsoever. John is a big, strong lawman. Alicia is his girlfriend. Sh Shadow Wolves are all just John's lackeys, and they're all completely interchangeable. The villains are also all interchangeable, mustache-twirling dunces, and they're only there to make the heroes look cool. And with the exception of Zoe Redbird from House of Night, John is easily, easily the biggest Mary Sue I've ever seen. And if he did save the day at the end, and like everyone decided they loved John because, oh, you saved everyone in America, everything's great. Like if that happened, he would be a bigger Mary Sue than her, but it didn't, so he isn't. And there's, there's just not a single 
moment anywhere in here where he struggles or is wrong about anything. Like, not one. You'd think somewhere in there they might do it by accident, but there's just nothing there. Like, he's just too perfect. He's a book form of most of Steven Seagal's film characters. Like, his ego is too fragile to ever be anything other than an unparalleled badass, so even in fights, his characters never get hit. The bad guys just fall over in fear of them, but it kind of just makes everyone involved look like a big loser. The pros, I mean, Christ, like, I, I could literally open any random page and read a paragraph from it and you would be able to see just how stupid the actual writing of this is. Like, calling the descriptions minimal is like calling a tornado a light breeze. Like, I, I showed you guys some of the funnier ones, but believe me, there are so many in here. Like, if someone ever does an audio reading of this, I will gladly listen to that because that would probably make this a lot more uh, tolerable. But, I don't know. I, I know nothing about what anyone looks like except for John. Like, I guess everyone is smaller than him. Uh, but that's about it. And even then, we don't know. We don't get that much detail on what John looks like. Uh, the action is like a toddler on a sugar high trying to relay a Jackie Chan movie to you. Like... I think it would take Morrissey 20 minutes to describe what he thinks a punch is. It's just... The constant over-explaining of things makes it feel like this was a fan fiction written by a 10-year-old child, but that child has only ever read other fan fiction written by 10-year-old children. The dialogue... The dialogue feels like it was written by an AI trying to learn to be human. Like, it, it's uncanny valley. It's not quite machine, but it's not quite human either. It's... It's unsettling at times. There's no spelling errors, which is honestly more than I expected after the first, like, five pages. I was expecting to find a bunch of those spread throughout, but no, there's there's none in there, but there's still some very odd syntax throughout, which makes things hard to follow. Like, I had to go back and reread sentences dozens of times throughout this. Like, the only praise I could possibly give this thing is that it's all in English. Now, obviously, it's full of bigotry. It's mostly towards Muslims and Arabs, but there is a bit towards American Indians as well, which I talked about, like, oh, yes, they're they're magical. It's, it's, uh, like, that's still not okay. It's a positive stereotype, I guess, but it's still, you shouldn't lump people together and judge them based off of stereotypes like that. Um, I also left out that there is some towards black people as well, mostly when insulting Barack Obama, and a fair amount towards Latinos as well. It basically says that they only join cartels because they're all stupid psychopaths, and it mentions, like, their police and government are all obviously so corrupt because that's just what, what those people are like. It just... ugh, it's bad. And it kind of implies that the deep state is run by the Jews. That's a dangerous road for you to go down, Stephen. You're half Jewish, bro. You, you might want to be careful with the types of people you associate with if those are the kinds of lines you're going to be peddling. But basically, all that stuff just gave me a headache, and so I, ju I just left it out. You know, it's it, it was no fun at that point, and so I was just like, okay, whatever, let's move on. And the chapter titles are pretty goddamn funny. I read some of them. There's like, Deep State Sign in the Desert, Hot Girl, Bad Boys, The Cartel, A Good Boy Learns to Murder. Deep State Shootout, Girls' Night Out, Deep State Jihadist Army Revealed, like, it just, these are really terrible. Like, it, there's nothing good in this book, okay? Just absolutely nothing. It's, it's written by people who already think they know ev everything, and they cannot handle any sort of criticism, which makes it almost impossible to write a decent book. Like, you need an editor to tell you what you did wrong so that you can fix it, because even the best only get there by smoothing over the cracks that their first draft has. Like, what, whatever your favorite author is, that they wrote a first draft and then there were a lot of problems with it, but they had to smooth it over. This, I'm fairly certain, just had the one draft and then they're like, okay, we're good, let's do some spell check and then we're done. Uh, they created a world where all their fantasies or delusions are true, 
but they still couldn't make them make sense. In fact, at a couple of points, they accidentally make a compelling argument against most of the shit that they're trying to push in here because they just make the logical fallacies stand out more. But, even if you just treat it as a pure work of fiction, even if you set aside like all the political agendas they're trying to push and the fact that Steven Seagal is very clearly trying to insert himself in here to act like some big badass, and even if you're just treating it like, okay, it's a thriller story, let's just read that, turn my brain off, it still doesn't work. Like, e even absolute dog shit like True Allegiance tries to have an exciting plot and relatable characters, this is nothing but hollow dogma and fear. Like, it's just pure pandering from cover to cover. Like, that that's all that's there. It's not even that there's a lot of pandering in there, it's that this entire thing is nothing but pandering. Like, there's no allegory or themes to speak of. Any ideas that are there are just right in your face, lacking any subtlety or nuance whatsoever. Like, you're allowed to do things that I disagree with, certainly, and that members of your audience might disagree with. You're allowed to do that. But if you want to change minds or have messages stick, you've got to be more subtle about it, and you obviously have to uh, be more consistent in how you apply those ideas and beliefs. Like, that's why Fern Gully is thought of as preachy crap, while Forrest Gump is a beloved film. Like, the messages in Forrest Gump are a bit more subtle, and even if you disagree with the messages, or if you just don't understand them, you can still just watch the movie and enjoy it as a movie. Uh, this, this book, The Way of the Shadow Wolves, is bankrupt, okay? It is morally bankrupt, artistically bankrupt, intellectually bankrupt, and patriotically bankrupt. Not that I'm much of a patriot myself, really, but these guys clearly think that they are while also hating and attacking things that form a foundation for this country that they claim to love so much. Like, things like respect for democratic process, openness to immigration, equality among all people, protecting uh, people from being abused by the government or the police. Like, this book takes all of those things and just shits all over them and says that they're stupid. Like, the, the people who wrote this, their idea of America is one where they are not only in charge of all things at all times, but they are unquestioned in being in charge of all things at all times. Anything less than that to them is oppression, and it only happens because everyone in the world is out to get them. And the thing is, this doesn't even have much passion behind it. Like, it just feels lazy, mostly because of the lack of editing, but like, Usually, even the crappiest books I've ever found fe felt like they had some passion behind it. Like, I, I keep comparing this to the Onision trilogy for pretty obvious reasons, but, like, I feel like Greg was being passionate when he wrote those. I don't think that Seagal and Morrissey were being passionate when they wrote this. So, like, I'm not even going to give credit for the work that went into this since I don't think there was much work that went into this. Like, this is 220 pages. It is barely novel length, and it feels 20 times longer. And it's not even really fun or funny beyond a few out-of-context lines, most of which I read to you. See, things like The Room or Samurai Cop are terrible movies, obviously, but they're a lot of fun because even if they're inept, they have passion and energy put into them. Like, the passion and energy is put in the wrong places, but that's what makes them fun and interesting. This not only feels incompetent, it feels lazy, and it feels like it was written almost out of spite, but it mostly just feels lazy. Like, I would read True Allegiance a hundred more times before I ever touch this again. I, I, I would rather never read another book in my life other than whatever Onision writes than ever read this again. Because as much as I despise The Lovely Bones, and I, and I really do, I really do hate The Lovely Bones. If that hasn't come through by now, it never will, but... I, I can see the appeal of some of it. Like, at the very least, it felt like it was put together by professionals. The only people who would genuinely claim to like this are people who are looking to have their beliefs validated. Which is dumb, because this is a work of fiction, and it doesn't really validate anything. And then there's gonna be a bunch of people who read it and hate it, but they're gonna pretend to like it to, like, own the libs or whatever. Ugh. There's... I don't know. There, there's really nothing to say. There's there's nothing good here, and it shits the bed on basically every level. It's a hateful, 
pile of shit which is just there to pander to nah, you, you get it by now it's it's just there to pander and well just just don't read it like there's no value to be found here stay far away from this piece of shit like if there is a worse book out there keep keep it away from me like i i don't think i'll ever find one worse than this one that i hate more than this and i know i'm probably tempting fate by saying that but fuck it i'm gonna say it like i I don't think I'll ever find a worse one. I've said that about the Lovey Bones, and that lasted me nine years, so maybe maybe by saying this, I'll have to wait until I'm 33 before I find something worse. But no, nah, I, just, I just don't think I ever will. And if there is, then I want to stay far, far away from it. I, I don't know what my next big review will be, but whatever it is, it will honestly be a relief to get back to that. And... Uh, Man, this is, good. this is gonna be a long one, but I hope y'all have a nice day later. Hey, guess what? If you made it this far, you are one of my best friends. All the names you see here, yeah, those are my patron names, especially the $10 and up guys, those are the best ones, and their names are Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santodis, Carolina Clay, Christopher Quinton, Dan Antlasiovich, I hope I got that right, Echo Joel, Karkat Kitsune, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Madison Lewis Bennett, Marilyn Roxy, Micaphone, Sad Mardigan, Tobacco Crow, Tom Beanie, and Vevictus. You are all absolutely the best, and all the other names on here, also the best. If you want to support the channel and get things like early access to videos, then consider becoming a patron. And if you don't feel like doing that, then you can always just tip me over on PayPal, become a channel member, or just like this video and share it around, comment on it, subscribe to my channel, you know, all that stuff that I kind of need to eat. So, you know, just do all that and you will also become my best friend. That's right. This isn't a parasocial relationship. You are all actually my best friend. You actually know me very well.